Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this edition of the Senate Committee on Commerce and Labor. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Buck? Here. Senator Daly? Here. Senator Hammond? Senator Lang? Here. Senator Pazina? Here. Senator Scheibel? Here. Senator Stone? Here. Chair Spearman? Here. Good morning, everyone, and want to welcome everyone who is here with us in Carson City and also to those who are joining us uh, down south in Las Vegas, those who are joining us remotely and over the phone. Uh, I want to welcome you today. We've got three bill hearings today. Uh, first, I want to take a little time to go over some health, health, mm, housekeeping. I can talk this morning. Some housekeeping items. Um, uh, as you know, all of these um, proceedings can be viewed through our streaming service uh, or the legislature's YouTube channel, both of which can be accessed uh, on our website. There are various ways that you can participate in person in Carson City, telephonically, uh, over the phone, submitting written comment and sharing your opinion via the legislature's opinion uh, application on Nellis. Anyone wishing to testify in person should sign in at the table at, by the door and please present a business card if you have one to the committee secretary. Any exhibits for the committee must be submitted on electron electronic format no later than 8 o'clock a.m. the day before. Submit your exhibits to Terry Miller, our committee, policy, uh, our, our committee manager, or our policy analyst, Cesar Megarejo. When testifying, please remember to turn your microphone on and clearly state and spell your name. Speak clearly and project your voice so that those who are watching or listening to us online can hear and understand. Remember to turn your microphone off when you finish speaking. A reminder to all those who testify that pursuant to <clears throat> Nevada Revised Statute 218E.085, it is unlawful for a person to knowingly misrepresent facts when testifying before a legislative committee. A person who knowingly does so is guilty of a misdemeanor. In addition, both the chair and members may request any testifier to submit documentation supporting their testimony. All committee-related information is available on Nellis, which is accessible from the legislature's website. And finally, please, please, please turn off your telephones so that they do not interrupt the proceedings. Okay? And with that, our overflow room is 2149, 2149. Anyone who is here or on their way that wants to go to the overflow room is 2149. All right, we will start. I see Senator Nguyen here, and so let's get started today with a bill hearing on Senate Bill 108, the measure revises provisions governing brew pubs. Senator Nguyen, please begin when you are ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, I am Rochelle Wynn, and I represent Senate District 3 in Central Las Vegas. And today I'm here to present Senate Bill 108. Senate Bill 108 would allow craft brewers to transport and sell their own beer to their own tap rooms and to special events. Under the current law, craft brewers must use a wholesaler to transport their, between their locations and to special events. Um, I first want to start off by saying that um, I've always heard that it is a party here in your um, committee chair, and with all the beer and weed in the room here today, um, I think that is definitely true. Um, I brought this bill forward um, after hearing from Nevada craft brewing industry on the challenges that they were facing as a small business in this state. Um, as many of you know or don't know or will hear right now, I am a small business owner. I'm also a lawyer, but I also have to run that business as well. So I think 
face the unique challenges that a lot of small businesses um, also express. Most of the time when you do have a small business, um, you are trying to make payroll, you are the person trying to do that, you are trying to make sure that you abide by all and any and all regulations, and you're also trying to do whatever it is that your business does. So for me, it is being a lawyer, so I am a lawyer and also a business person. And I know with a lot of these craft brewers, not only are they creating a product, um, they are also trying to um, be successful and get that product out to as many people. Um, I know that many of the people on this committee, probably everyone on this committee, the way that they come up with bills that they are going to bring are those that are brought to them from the people in their communities, from their very own constituents. Um, looking to us to say, how can you solve this problem? Can you help me solve this problem? A lot of times, sometimes it's, hey, I have some potholes and I'm able to not do um, a legislative action and not have to change the NRS in order to solve that problem. And I'm able to work with our partners in local government and county government to figure out how I can solve that problem. Unfortunately, after trying to solve this problem, um, you know, um, not through the legislative process, I realized I needed to bring this bill, and that is why we are sitting here today. Um, when I was talking to craft brewers, and not only am I a small business owner, I'm a beer lover, so I'm assuming a lot of people in here are, um, and I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. I grew up in Washington State, um, where there was a very prolific craft brewing industry. And when I moved here in 1999, I was under the assumption that we would have that same kind of growth within that industry. The economic impact um, that craft breweries can have in the small business community is pretty impactful. Um, if we look at just our small market here that we have in the state of Nevada, I believe there are 51 local craft brewers. The, they are making Nevada made, Nevada owned, Nevada breweries that are um, brewing beer and employing people in our state. Um, I think you'll hear from some of my other presenters, some of the numbers that we're talking about is within those 51 brewers, they are employing 4,100 employees. And on average, I think the salary is around 45, 46,000. Um, so we have some pretty significant things, and I think you're being handed some information that supplements some of those like economic impact numbers that I'm giving you. Um, I'm looking around at the committee, and I have the opportunity to kind of look, and some of the members of the Craft Brewers Association are have businesses, small businesses, that are located in each one of your committees here um, that sit before you. We have Bad Breed. Bad Beat Brewing in um, Henderson. We also have Abel Baker Brewing, which is my go-to place in my community. Um, as you know from being here, you've gone to one of their members' events. Almost all of their events are at Great Basin Brewing, so that is another one of the craft brewers that is creating a product here in our state. Um, for those of you in Henderson, we have Love Lady Brewing, and um, in North Las Vegas, we have North Fifth Street Brewing um, Brewing Company that's out there as well. Um, just here in Carson City alone, you could have the opportunity to go to Shoe Tree Brewing as well as Great Basin Brewing. Um, and in Reno, we have Revision and Pigeon Head and Lead Dog and uh, many others. And so if you want that list, we can get you that list of craft brewers that are located in your communities and in your districts. By way of background, um, Nevada's alcohol industry is regulated by a three-tier system. And I just want to say this up front and first and foremost, I am not looking to undo the three-tier system. And in fact, I think that it serves a great deal in our state to have that system in place. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with the three-tier system, the first tier is the suppliers. And those are the people who manufacture beer. Um, this inclu includes like local brew pubs and manufacturers like Budweiser and Coors. Um, if they have suppliers and they are brewing that beer. Um, the second tier is um, uh, uh, importers or wholesalers. Sometimes we refer to them as distributors, but in statute they are referred to as wholesalers. Um, they buy the beer from the supplier and move and sell that product to retailers and other wholesalers. And that third tier includes retailers who can only buy from wholesalers and only sell to consumers. 
Um, a brew pub, by definition, it's already defined in statute. It's NRS 597.230, and it means an establishment that manufactures malt beverages and sells those malt beverages at a retail pursuant to those provisions. In Nevada, each craft brewer is only permitted to manufacture 40,000 barrels of malt liquor every calendar year, and they are only al allowed to manufacture an additional 20,000 barrels that can only be sold to out-of-state wholesalers, but they are limited to selling only 5,000 barrels on-site. And some of those provisions were made when the industry was getting off the ground. I believe it was in 1995. Yeah, 1995, so quite some time ago, um, in order to um, help our local craft brewers get into this thing and work within the existing three-tier system that we have. Um, I'm going to give you a breakdown of the bill. Section 1, this portion of the bill changes the definition of special events. Um, Currently in statute, um, you can, brew pubs, breweries, can transport their product to a one-day special event, and this expands it to three days. Um, per the existing statute, they are already limited to 20 events per year. So this bill does not seek to increase that number. It in seeks to increase the number of days for this special event. So for example, right now it is limited to like say a farmer's market or a charitable one day event. And this would expand it to a three day event. Um, what I think most people would think of is like a three day event like Life is Beautiful or something like that where they would have to do that. I want to make it very clear too that um, there are still like procedures that these breweries have to go through under existing statute to transport their beer to a charitable event or to one of these one day farmers markets and they have to go through and they still have to get a notice to transport from the Department of Tra Taxation and they have to go through all the local and city ordinances and permitting to be able to do those products. Section 2 allows a brew pub to transport beer from its manufacturing site um, to a location operated by that same brew pub, such as a tap room, and this makes some conforming changes. I think it's important to um, kind of um, look at that and to look at what we're asking, because I think there's a lot of misunderstandings and misrepresentations um, about what the bill actually allows for, and I think I'm... I know we're all aware of that keyword, unintended consequences, and I think that this is narrowly tailored in order to avoid any of those unintended consequences. And I know some of the people that are testifying and support some of our small business owners that are in our community, as well as my co-presenters here to my right, um, will be able to give you some of those more specific numbers about what they are actually seeing. I'm actually excited to see all of these drivers in here. I think there's a lot of people that are first time to the legislature and there's a lot of people that are wanting to participate in this because it matters. Um, and I'm excited to see all these drivers here um, because I think we all want the same thing. We want these small craft brewers to be so successful that they need to have add more routes. Um, that our distributors and our wholesalers need to add more routes to get this product out to more people um, so they can distribute on a mass scale. So they are not just here asking to distribute to their own tap room that they own. Um, this came to me when I was talking to Wendy here that's next to me um, about some of the uh, you know struggles that she's had in opening up her tap room in um, downtown Las Vegas. Um, in on Main Street, like off of Main Street, and transporting her own product. She was having a hard time getting her own product that is brewed in her brewery in Henderson that they have, you know, inputted millions of dollars in order to get that structure and those brewery, like, um, components in place to do, to get her own product to her tap room that is also called Craft House that serves her own beer. So, um... Hopefully this will solve that problem, and that is what we are looking to solve. Um, and from that, I will actually turn this over right now to Wendy Forrest from Craft House Brewing to discuss the bill and the impacts on craft brewers throughout her state from her very personal experience. Thank you, Senator. 
Uh, good morning, Chair and members of the committee. Um, as uh, my senator said, uh, for the record, I am Wendy Forrest. I'm the owner of Craft House Brewery in Henderson and Las Vegas, which is now known as Brewery Row uh, in downtown Las Vegas in the Arts District, as well as I serve as the president for the Nevada Craft Brewers Association. Um, in 2021, Nevada breweries produced just over 78,000 barrels of beer and contributed $528 million in economic impact for our state. However, 3% of total beer sales are made up of Nevada beer sales within Nevada. So that means that we're flooding our state with beer that's not made here by Nevadans, for Nevadans, employing Nevadans, and contributing to the Nevada tax base. Uh, our members are local small businesses that were working to grow our industry and economy by investing back in brick and mortar establishments. There's many studies that prove that breweries that move into an economically uh, challenged areas improve those areas. And the Arts District is a gleaning example of that, as well as Water Street and many locations up here in the north. Craft brewers are taxed on the federal, state, and local levels, and we are also uh, open to being um, audited at any time by any one of those three. Uh, we pay excise tax on the beer that we produce, no matter what avenue it takes where it travels, whether it goes to a wholesaler, whether we sell it within our tap rooms, or whether it goes outside of the state for distribution. Uh, we also pay property tax, modified business tax, unemployment tax, just as other Nevada businesses do. And we rem remit our sales and use tax monthly to the Nevada Department of Taxation. Uh, SB 108 is requesting for an inner facility transport. So we make the beer at our brew pub. It's redundant to build and invest another $2 million to build another brew pub when we don't need to do that. We'd rather put that money back in our community and hiring more employees. Uh, and we're also asking to have a larger role at special events within our own city that supports our community. Uh, currently, we can donate our product to nonprofit events, or we can transport our product and to a one-day farmer's event where they can sell our product. Uh, currently, how this system works from a brewer's perspective is um, we brew the beer, the, our distributor picks it up, uh, we submit an order for our beer down at the Las Vegas location, and then we buy back our beer that we brewed for 38% more than we sold it to our distributor on Monday. Um, it's shocking still to me, <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. However, I do really need to stress that my brewery and every brewery in Nevada could not be successful without a successful wholesaler. We value our distributor. They allow us access into um, accounts on, especially on the strip or larger accounts that we could never be able to open those doors. I don't want to uh, end my relationship with my distributor. I would just like to control my own product at my own business. Um, also, breweries have challenges stocking their own ta uh, tasting rooms. So once the product is sold to our wholesaler, it is their product. Um, it doesn't mean that that product needs to show up on time or the order that we placed needs to show up at our tasting rooms. Um, a tap room is a retail establishment um, that is an extension of our brew pub. Under the wholesaler contracts, uh, the wholesalers um, should be um, providing services such as cleaning our tap, rhyme, tap lines, uh, servicing our account with sales reps, uh, money allocated for marketing. Um, none of those are provided to my tap room. Uh, special events allow breweries to directly market their products to um, our fans and our guests. Uh, they increase sales, we pay more taxes, uh, potentially increasing our hiring base. Uh, we increase sales for our distributors. We are out there marketing our brands so the distributors may sell more for us. Uh, we also increase the ability of local breweries to further engage in charity functions, community outreach, and community events. Um, and also, um, Senator Wynn mentioned earlier, uh, 
Nevada brew pubs have a cap on production. We can only produce 40,000 barrels annually, and within that cap, only 5,000 barrels are allowed to be sold within our tap rooms at retail. Um, so there's already a gap stop built into NRS that has been there, I believe, for eight years now. Um, many wholesalers have a minimum order, and I understand that. It covers the cost of our drivers behind us and to pay them a fair and living wage. However, if a brew pub only needs two kegs for a special beer release that they're planning on a Friday, that's not going to meet the minimum order. Therefore, they can't have that special release of their own beer that they invested heavily in infrastructure and in hiring to make that product in the first place. Um, and just as a point of clarification, uh, we, our taxes are excise taxes on the federal level as well as on the state level. That's based on volume that we produce, no matter whether it goes to a wholesaler, a retailer, or it's sold within our own brew pubs. And also, one last thought on the bill is Nevada breweries, we rank 44th in the nation for beer produced um, compared to the rest of the states in the nation. However, Clark County ranks in the top three counties in the nation for the highest alcohol consumption per capita. Um, that's a glaring, glaring disparity between what we're making here in our state and what we're supporting coming into our state. We're being flooded with products that are not made by Nevadans, that aren't uh, Nevada um, job creators. It's time that uh, we support small business. It's easy to say, it's easy to post on our phones, support small business, and this is why we're here asking for your support to, sm to uh, support small Nevada breweries. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, Jessica Ferrado here on behalf of the Nevada Craft Brewers Association. I'm mostly here to help answer questions, but I did want to say that this bill is about supporting small local businesses in the state who have invested in brick and mortar facilities, who are hiring our Nevadans, and this will create efficiencies for our businesses that will allow us to grow and to allow Nevada businesses to flourish. Thank you. And I, I just want to point out that I, I think we've all seen how transformative our small businesses, and particularly our breweries, have been in our communities. I think for those of you that are familiar with downtown Las Vegas, you can see in that arts district and along Main Street how transformative um, Abel Baker Brewing has been on one end of that Main Street and, you know, as a part of that redevelopment effort. I know that they have worked very, like, closely with um, our local city governments, including the city of Las Vegas, the city of Henderson, as well as the city of North Las Vegas, just to name a few um, in the southern part of the region. And I know we have that same kind of partnerships in the northern and rural areas of um, our state as well. Um, sometimes they can be an anchor. For those of you that are familiar with Water Street and Henderson, you can look at Love Lady Brewing and how, you know, creating that partnership to be able to build that brick and mortar thing really transformed that end of that street and has really led to the revitalization of both of those roads and both of those communities. Um, I think you will start to see that same kind of redevelopment with the introduction of the fifth, um, the North, is it North Fifth? brewing in um, North Las Vegas as well. Um, and, you know, I, as a small business owner and as a part-time um, small business highlight, reluctant social media person, I think one of the most exciting things about that process is getting to know these small businesses, getting to know their families, and know what kind of impact they can have in this community. Um, this bill is very, very, very narrowly tailored, and it is very, very similar. I always think of it this way. If you were a pizza restaurant, like a Domino's or even a local like re pizza restaurant, and you want, for me, it's Broadway Pizza on Rancho in Charleston, if you've been there. It's delicious. Um, but I can call them, order my pizza, and they can send out a delivery driver for the product that they made. 
If we then said, or as a legislature, it was our policy for that small business that created that pizza, that they were mandated to use DoorDash or Postmates or Uber Eats, I think we would be sitting here and everyone would be shaking their heads like, you can't, they made that product. They should be able to deliver that product <laughs> that they made. And that's what distinguishes this from like, you know, the argument that this is imploding an entire three-tier system. Like you heard from Wendy and you'll hear from other brewers, they want to be successful. They want to, like, develop more routes. They want more than 2% of their product to be transported. They want to be a bigger, like, impact in the state of Nevada. They don't want um, outside brewers who have unlimited production numbers to be able to come in and take up, I think, what did we say? It was 97% of the beer market is outside vendors. Um, they want to be able to be a part of that. So that is what we are hoping to do, and we are open for any questions that you might have. Thank you. Um, Senator Buck? Thank you so much, Chair Spearman. Um, this may be or may not be relevant, but I was just wondering why we put a cap on Nevada company production. Um, Nevada Brewery production. Uh, Wendy Forrest, for the record. Thank you for that question, Senator Buck. You're actually my senator, so thank you for asking oh. that. Um, my answer is I don't know. Honestly, I don't know why we would cap our own production within our own state and hamper business and impose these uh, limits that are arbitrary and uh, neighboring states don't have limits. As a point of perspective, Utah. Utah has no uh, production limit. Do you, may I, um, do you ever go over the cap or do any of the other breweries like, or then you just stop producing? Uh, we have not personally. Um, I know that a few sessions ago when uh, the brewers did ask to increase the cap because it was previously 15,000 barrels, Great Basin was getting close to that uh, limit. But it also, it hinders larger breweries for wanting to come and invest and in our state and brew beer here. Thank you. Additional questions? Ms. Senator Stone. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your, uh, your testimony today. And uh, I live in Henderson, where some of these brew pubs are, and uh, frequently uh, go on Water Street and, uh, and enjoy the, the redevelopment that the, I, I guess you could say is happening on Water Street. So a couple of questions. One is, um, prior to this bill coming forward, many of you decided to open up your tasting rooms, uh, tap rooms as you call them. And I assume you had a business model that show that this was an efficacious way of expanding your business and hopefully making a profit and creating jobs. Uh, and now you're here requesting us to change rules for some very compelling reasons, but how does this, uh, how did you come up with a business model that accounted for this 38% increase and uh, having to buy back your product? Have you still been able to make a profit with the existing system, number one? And number two, if uh, maybe the author can just outline in a little bit more detail how the Department of Taxation collects taxes on brewed product so that it's tracked, if you will. I, I believe it's taxed at the, at the point of manufacturing. So uh, it'd be like a wholesaler that uh, transfers their product from one wholesaler to another wholesaler or a retailer. Um, a lot of people think it was gambling that built uh, all these big hotels in Las Vegas. I think alcohol had a very big uh, part of that, and the wholesalers have a very uh, tight grip on ensuring that the state uh, receives their appropriate uh, tax revenue. Um, how would you react to some of the opponents saying that uh, we're going to be missing some taxes as a result of um, breaking this uh, tradition of having wholesalers control 100% of the alcohol distribution and sales in Nevada? Wendy Forrest, for the record. Um, so our business model would be similar to a business model of, of another bar. Um, so once the wholesaler sells the beer to the retailer, then you factor in uh, another margin to cover your expenses. Um, and uh, bars can be very successful. 
Uh, the margin on beer is not great. The margin on liquor is more favorable, but we don't produce liquor. Um, and as far as how we're taxed um, and how we're tracked, we report the volume that is produced at our brew pub uh, every month in the form of excise taxes to the federal government, so the TTB, as well as the Nevada Department of Taxation. Um, and uh, then we also, when we sell at retail, we're responsible for collecting the sales and use tax and remitting that back to uh, the state of Nevada. Um, wholesalers do not collect any taxes from the breweries and brew pubs. Uh, that is not their function. Uh, that's the function of the Nevada Department of Taxation. And all brew pubs are um, open and available um, to be audited, just like any other business would be. So they would look at your books, they would look at your profit and loss, compared it against what your um, reporting as volume produced, um, and then uh, audit from there. Are you, if I may continue, are, are you aware of uh, any of your, uh, maybe this is for your, your, your colleague next to you, uh, is it uncommon that uh, brew pubs are randomly audited by the Department of Taxation to make sure that the appropriate taxes are paid? Do you want to answer that? Mm -hmm. uh, we were just audited. Okay. I'm currently going through it right now. Okay. <laughs> State your name. State your name. <laughs> Sorry, Wendy Forrest for the record. And then a final follow-up. Uh, assuming this bill does go through, uh, you're, you're paying 30% premium, you allege, for buying your own product back, even with the uncertainty of the availability of your own product. Uh, is it your goal to make uh, purely more profit, or is this a way for you to reduce the cost for the consumers that are coming to your establishments to buy your product? Our goal is to expand our production um, and service more accounts throughout the state. We are distributed uh, in um, Clark County as well as up here in the north. Um, we have the opportunity now, brewers who own brew pubs, we have the opportunity to sell our product at a discount, but that would be doing a disservice to 300 of craft houses' personal accounts. It doesn't serve me to undercut my uh, retailers by serving beer at a discount. The percentage of beer that I move to our tap rooms is under about 10% of our total volume. So it doesn't do any uh, brew pub any service by discounting their product uh, at uh, potentially losing those uh, retail accounts who are really moving the bulk of, of, their, of your product through their retail accounts. And just one last follow-up, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. My colleague mentioned the, the 5,000 barrels per tap room. Um, I think that puts you at a competitive disadvantage with some of these larger breweries, Stone Brewery from California, where I'm from. Um, it seems to me that, uh, I don't know if, there, if that was an arbitrary number that came up, and I know this bill isn't going to be dealing with that, but I would certainly like to see our our breweries, uh, our local pub breweries, um, have a higher limit so they can compete with some of these bigger bigger companies that are coming in, because you mentioned, what was it, 3%, 6%, 3% of our, our beer in this state is Nevada-born, if you will, Nevada-made. Yeah. Uh, I would like to see that percentage increase, and in any way we can help effectuate that, I would love to help with that. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Stone. Thank you. Um, Senator Pazina, and I should have said this at first, but we've got three bills to hear, so I'm going to ask committee members if you limit your questions to two. Uh, we got 21, uh, 40 people that are, you know, signed up to speak, so please limit your questions to two. Uh, so take this time and figure out which two are really important to you, and the others, uh, we can take that offline, okay? Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair, and I only have one question. Um, so just to confirm my understanding of Section 2, essentially it is for the transport only of those products made on-premises to another facility that your business owns, and then wholesalers would be used for all other transport. Just to confirm my understanding, and thank you. Wendy Forrest, for the record, that is correct. Senator Scheibel. Uh, thank you. So I just want to clarify... Um, because it's, it's not the most complicated scheme we have in the NRS, but it is a little bit complicated because we have the rules for the brew pubs, we have the rules for the three-tier system, we have the special events. And so um, I, I just want to make sure that we're closing all, all the loopholes, if you will. And so and I don't want to impugn any beer wholesalers or pro 
producer, so let's just, you know, assume that I'm an evil attorney who wants to make a lot of money, and what is to stop me from partnering with a huge um, beer company, Coors, Bud Light, um, Keystone, and um, operating myself, their plant in Nevada, and then operating 17 PTs and thereby skirting the wholesale model to get my cores to my PTs. Okay. Wendy Forrest, for the record, um, we're limited at 5,000 barrels for retail um, sales directly within our own tasting rooms. Uh, so that would stop that concern. If, if I may, Madam Chair, through you to Senator Scheibel. Also, let's go to rent. Thank you, Senator. Um, we're also limited in the barrel amount we can produce in the state. So let's say a Coors wanted to come here. They would be limited and wouldn't make sense for them to do that. The other piece that we haven't seen this in other states where as craft brewers are moving their product to their own location, which is a very small portion of our of our production, um, that we've seen a, a big party come into the state to, to do that, to be honest. And honestly, we, they would still be subject to not only the barrel cap statewide, but the barrel cap on site. Thank you, and if I could have one more. Um, I see the change in the definition of special events, but I couldn't find where in the NRS brew pubs are allowed to tr transport to special events or sell at special events. I know it's in there, <laughs> but um, I can't find it. And so my question is, <laughs> if we're going from one day events to three day events, um, are they selling their beer at those events, giving it away or something else? Wendy Forrest, for the record, we're asking to operate as a vendor at that special event, and the events need to be licensed by local jurisdiction. Thank you. And the section, Rochelle Wynn, for the record, is NRS 597.200, subsection 11, subsection A. So if you're actually looking at the language of this bill, you'll see the changes that are made to that um, section 11 special events. It, it says what it means and it says how long it is. It's in the red language. Well, so I see that part. <clears throat> what I don't see is where in the NRS the definition of special event is necessary. Because if we're defining special event, I would assume somewhere in the NRS it says brew pubs can operate at special events or cannot operate at special events or must apply for a license for special events. And that's the part I can't find. Thank you. Understood now, <laughs> Senator. It's under NRS 597-200, sub 11. Special event means an event that is... Nope, that's the same section. <laughs> I'm saying if we're defining special events, it must be used somewhere else in the statute. Okay, are you... So where else is it used in the statute? Okay, so 597-230, section... Just a second. 3B is the portion that talks about us being able to sell at special events. Thank you. Through, a, through Thank a, you. Other, another th a third party. Got it. Committee members? Okay. Uh, thank you. And um, I sure hope my bishop wasn't listening when you said this is a party committee. So <laughs> my license might be in jeopardy. <laughs> Um, and so with that, what, will you have anybody else that's going to present with you? Okay. With that, we will move to support. And as I previously stated, we've got three bills that we've got to get to today. Uh, and so we're going to uh, allocate 20 minutes for each side. If you're going to come up and say something, we're going to limit that to one minute. And if someone has already said what you want to say, please say ditto. And I think I have chocolate in my uh, office that uh, I can bring <laughs> if you just comply. So uh, with that, we'll open up support uh, here in uh, Carson City and uh, anyone who's in support down south, you just move to the table. Okay, we'll look Broadcast, let's go to the phones. I don't see anybody moving in either place. Let's go to the phones. Anyone in support? And support means that you are saying yes. Thank you, Chair. To testify in support of SB 108, please press star 9 now or raise hand in your Zoom window.
Again, to testify in support, please press star nine now or raise hand in your Zoom window. Hi, this is Kevin Drake uh, from Alibi Aleworks in Incline Village, Nevada. I'll be very brief. Uh, we started our brewery in 2014 in Incline Village on the Nevada side and have basically, we, we have a brew pub in um, California and as we look to expand our business, we're currently looking at more options on the California side because California makes it quite easy to add additional tap rooms, whereas Nevada makes it quite expensive and cumbersome. So. We're proud to be a Nevada-based business, and right now our best option is to grow towards California side, um, and we would much prefer to grow towards the Nevada side. This bill would help. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sir, can you spell your last name, please? Broadcast, is he still there? Where's Rizard? Sorry, yeah. Uh, my name is Kevin Drake. Sorry about that. Spell your last name, please. Uh, D-R-A-K-E. Okay, thank you. Broadcast, anyone else? Yes, Chair. Caller with the last three digits of 643. Please go ahead. Liz Rizar, Deputy State Director with Americans for Prosperity. Um, definitely want to expressed on behalf of Americans for Prosperity, we support this bill. We'll keep it short. We support small businesses. We think removing this ban will empower our local brewery to be more effective and contribute effectively in our community. Thank you. We urge you to support SB 108. Thank you. Thank you. Can you spell your last name, please? R-O-U-Z-A-R-D. Okay, thank you. Anyone else in support on the phones? Yeah, this is Bark Serini at the Brewers Association. We're the uh, Association for Independent Craft Brewers in America. We have 33 members in Nevada, and we are in support of SB 108. Anyone else broadcast? Okay, let's move down Caller to... the last three digits. Okay. Yeah, we'll take oh, this call. Oh, I'm sorry, Chair. Yes, we have... Uh, we'll take this call in, and I'll more. move down to Las Vegas. Caller with the last three digits of 122. Please press star 6 now to unmute yourself. Mark Esty with Great Basin Brewing Company. Um, thank you. That's E-F-T-E-E. -E. Great Basin stands with uh, SB 108 and votes in favor. And uh, we just want to let, I just want to let you know that as Nevada's oldest brewery license number 001, um, we want to continue to have all our boats rise in the same tide. We believe in small businesses and we love our distributors. We just feel this is something that will help all our breweries. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go down to uh, Las Vegas, uh, see two people in support. Is there anyone else in Las Vegas that's in support? There's a third chair there. Okay. Yes, uh, let's begin uh, with the person in the middle. For the record, my name is Linda Lovelady. I sit on the board of the Nevada Craft Brewers Association as a legislative chair. The three-tier laws were never intended to become an antiquated, restricted, unmovable system that suffocates the growth of entrepreneurs, the law should act as a framework, like a constitution, that is flexible, can be amended to reflect the current business environment and support ec economic growth. Of course, as the Nevada Craft Brewers Association, we support SB 108. Please keep made in Nevada, in Nevada, and say yes. Thank you again. Thank you. Next. Uh, my, uh, for the record, my name is uh, Richard Lovelady, uh, owner-operator of Lovelady Brewing Company in Henderson, Nevada. I've uh, been brewing craft beer in Nevada for 27 years now. 
um, and I'm in support of 108. Uh, I, first of all, I just want uh, briefly to say uh, we're, we're not looking for a handout here. I, uh, you know, we do own a tap room. Um, total volume on that, if we maybe between one and 200 barrels for the whole year. And when you're talking about 2.4 million barrels of beer being consumed in Nevada, um, I, I don't even know what the percentage is on that. So, um, but that money will stay in Nevada, be reinvested in our company, raises more equipment uh, and those kind of things. So please support 108, thank you. Thank you, broadcast, anyone else on the phone? Yes, Chair. Again, if you've recently just joined us, we are currently in support of SB 108. To testify in support, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Hi, my name is Robert Snyder. I'm the CFO for Big Dogs Brewing Company in Las Vegas. Uh, we've been one of the earlier uh, we've been in, in business since 1993, along with Great Basin. So we've, we've seen all these regressive beer-related policies throughout the years, including caps on what can be produced and sold through the three-tier system, limits on what can be produced and exported to other states, and these restrictions on promoting our businesses. While we're appreciative of our relationship with our wholesalers and have worked together to expand our brands throughout Nevada, not everything should have to go through their doors. SB 108 represents modest reforms that will allow these eligible businesses to better represent their brands directly. We are in support. And my name is Robert Snyder, S-N-Y-D-E-R. Thank you. Broadcast, anyone else? Hello, my name is Jason Taylor, for the record, last name Taylor, T-A-Y-L-O-R. I'm the owner of Nevada Brew Works in Las Vegas. And we're in support of SB 108. We're a newer brew pub that opened in sort of the new wave in the Arts District that brought about the Brewery Row. And I think it's important to know that, you know, Nevada's old way of thinking liquor laws have staggered growth and inhibited expansion of some of Nevada's 50 brew pubs. Uh, SB 108 allows brew pubs to implement Inter facility transfers between the locations and the special events. It's important to note that some 40 other states uh, allow such inter facility transfers, including neighboring states like California, Arizona, and Utah. And when you look at uh, Nevada Brew Pub's almost half a billion dollar economic impact, I think it's clear that the brewery landscape in, in Nevada is really poised for a bright future. And I think this provides a, a nice avenue for growth. We support SB 108. Caller with the last three digits of 544, please press star six now to unmute yourself. Hello, this is uh, Kyle Boulder, the owner of Las Vegas Brewing Company. Uh, I am in support of SB 108. Um, we are quite new to, to the Las Vegas market and looking to expand and grow uh, with a brewery that's located out of the Brewery Road District in the downtown area. Um, there's a, a, an attractive nature to, to joining the rest of the successful breweries down in that area to continue to grow and provide, you know, locally made product to Southern Nevadans as well as, as those who visit our city. So in short, Las Vegas Brewing Company supports SB 108, last name spelling D-O-L-D-E-R. Caller with the last three digits of 523, please press star six now to unmute yourself. One more time, caller with the last three digits of 523, please press star six on your phone to unmute yourself. OK, 
Okay, we will move on to the next caller. Please stand by, Chair. Hello, my name is Amanda Pion. <clears throat> I am the owner of North Fist Brewing Co. in North Las Vegas. Um, we are a little over a year old, um, and so we are so excited to be part of the beer community. Uh, we are proud to be the first brewery in North Las Vegas, and obviously it's our goal to expand. And this bill, SB 108, will help us to do that, to be able to transport our beer to our second location. And the three-day events really uh, increase our exposure to people that come to these events. And so, uh, in short, North Fifth Brewing Co. is in support of SB 108. Again, this was Amanda Pion, spelled P-A-Y-A-N. Good morning. My name is John Ovando with the Concerned Veterans for America here in Las Vegas, Nevada. We, too, are in support of SB 108. We believe that the current situation with the taxes is a bit unfair for you know, local and small businesses, and SB 108 will be there to correct it. Thank you. And the way that you spell my last name is O-V-A-N-T-O. Hi, this is Brianna Wagner, spelled W-A-G-N-E-R. I'm president and owner of Houston Brewing Company, a woman-owned business. Happy International Women's Day. We are in support of SB 108. We're a fairly new business. Uh, we only opened in 2021. So we are looking to do growth and expand and help contribute to our state. Um, we pay a lot of money in taxes. We pay a lot of revenue in other ways. And um we're constantly trying to create new jobs, and so therefore, this bill will help us do those things and continue to grow as a small business. So we support. Hi, this is uh, David Stone. Uh, my partner and I are planning a brewery uh, to open in Las Vegas. Um, and this is uh, key to supporting our efforts to do that or uh, potentially dissuading us if, if not. So uh, we're excited we're in support of this movement. So uh, the last name is Stone, S-T-O-N-E. Can you spell it one more time, please? I'm sorry, Terry, he is off the line, but he said Stone, S-T-O-N-E. Okay, thank you. Follow good with morning. the last two uh, digits of 623. I'm sorry, please continue. Uh, good morning. My name is Dave Forrest, F-O-R-R-E-S-T. I am the owner of Craft House Brewery in Henderson, Nevada, and I have a second location with my wife, Wendy, in Las Vegas. Uh, we are in support of SB 108. Uh, we would like to have control over the delivery of our own product to our own location in which we own, as well as participate in special events, gaining exposure of our brand. Um, we have been in business for eight years now, eight and a half for the brewery and three and a half for our secondary tasting room. Thank you very much for your time. Again, Craft House Brewery is in support of SB 108. Thank you. Good morning. This is Dale Norfolk, N-O-R-F-O-L-K, with Huddle Brewing, H-U-D-L, Huddle Brewing, in the Brewery Row in the Arts District of Las Vegas. We would uh, we are in support of SB 108. Thank you for your time. Caller with the last three digits of 385. I can see you're unmuted. Please continue. Good morning. This is Matt Johnson with Imbibe Brewery in Reno, Nevada. Uh, 
for the record, the last name is spelled J-O-H-N-S-O-N. Um, I just want the, the members of the committee to think for a minute about how um, a situation where maybe I have to explain to somebody who's putting on a special event that I can't participate. And due to just a little, uh, little part of a law that prohibits us from participating in a lot of things. And the same for when we have a special event at our own tap room and maybe the special beer that I'm releasing doesn't show up. And I try to explain to a customer why, because I have to buy the beer back and it didn't show up yet. It's hard to explain, and the reason is that it is illogical. It is illogical to have these prohibitions in place. So help us take a baby step forward, please, and support craft beer. Uh, we are definitely in support of SB 108. Thank you. Again, if you recently just joined us, we are still in testimony in support of SB 108. If you'd like to testify in support, please press star nine now or raise hand in your Zoom window. Participant with the last name of Aldrich, you may now unmute yourself. Hi there, uh, my name is Jazz Aldrich. I'm with Great Basin Brewing Company. Uh, Great Basin supports, as Mark already said. Last name Aldrich, A-L-D-R-I-C-H. Thank you. Hi, my name is Paul. Hi, my name is Paul Young with Shoe Tree Brewing. We are uh, Carson City's oldest operating brewery. Uh, we support this bill. It will allow us to grow our business and take a part of community events we haven't been able to in the past. Last name is spelled Y-O-U-N-G. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. You currently have no more callers in support at this time. Thank you. We'll move now to opposition. Uh, opposition here in Carson City. Any opposition down in uh, Las Vegas and opposition on the phone. And we'll do the same thing, 20 minutes uh, total and one minute per. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Alfredo Alonso. Today, on uh, uh, on behalf of the uh, uh, thousands of employees with uh, the Nevada Beer Wholesalers Association, uh, Southern Glacier Wine and Spirits, and uh, next to me, uh, 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 Brett Scaleri with uh, Breakthrough. Um, I would I would very quickly like to turn this over just for a quick legal analysis uh, by my partner, Lee Freed, who's in Las Vegas currently, if that's okay with you. So I, I can't tell if I'm on, uh, Chair. We can hear you. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, just briefly, to clarify some of the legal issues, I want to uh, lay out the re legal and regulatory structure. Brew pubs are defined as, um, as Senator Wynn indicated uh, in NRS 597-200. They're def defined as an establishment that manufactures malt beverages. A uh, tap room or secondary facility where product is not manufactured is not a brew pub. Brew pubs have enjoyed a special designation under Nevada law since at least 1995. Are brew pubs treated differently than other local businesses like bars and restaurants, other businesses that sell alcohol? The question is yes. This is because brew pubs can sell the beer that is manufactured on site directly to consumers either for consumption on site or in bottles, cans, growlers, 
or kegs that are taken off-site. These sales currently occur outside the three-tier system and are not subject to the dual reporting requirements to the Nevada Department of Taxation that are required for other liquor sales or imports that occur within the state of Nevada. Brew pubs also pay a lower excise, federal excise tax rate than that of beer, wine, or spirits. Uh, there's no limit on how many brew pubs any individual or company can operate. That's in uh, NRS 597-230. I also want to um, expand on some of the uh, testimony or description about the sales limits that apply under Nevada law. It's important to understand them. The sales limit for any individual brew pub facility, as, as you heard, is 5,000 barrels. Um, to, to understand that number, 5,000 barrels is 69,000 cases of beer. The sales limit for all the facilities that may be owned by one brew pub owner, operator, and sold in the state is 40,000 barrels per year. This is the equivalent of 551,000 cases of beer. And to put that into context, that is more beer, um, approaches twice as much beer as a company like Sierra Nevada Brewing imports into the state. It is a very large number. These caps are not restrictive in any way. In addition to that 40,000 um, barrel number, uh, brew pubs can also export for sale outside of the state of Nevada an additional 20,000 cases per year. That is uh, another um, 220,000 plus cases if you include all of those numbers together uh, the, uh, for the cap limits on what a brew pub, Nevada brew pub, can uh, manufacture in a year, it would put a brew pub on par with, um, that's about 80% of what a company like Boston Beer sells in the state of Nevada each year. These caps are not limiting they are, um, they're very expansive. Again, brew pubs in Nevada have no limitation on what products they can sell. They can be licensed as bars, liquor stores, restaurants, uh, including um, where other brands of uh, liquor or beer can be sold. But unlike other liquor stores, restaurants, or bars, existing Nevada law allows brew pubs to transport and sell their products at remote locations for up to 20 special events per year. These off-site sales occur outside of the three-tier system and the mandatory monthly dual reports from a supplier and a wholesaler that our Nevada system of taxation relies upon. There is no way outside of an audit for the tax department to verify that the proper tax has been paid for these special event sales. The Department of Taxation has uh, less than a handful of investigators, uh, even fewer auditors. The reason um, that we have the system that we have, the three-tier system, is to um, ensure that suppliers and wholesalers are providing um, duplicative reports to allow for the Department of Taxation to verify that the proper amount of tax is paid. That doesn't happen when one entity is making all the product and transporting all the product and selling all the product itself. Um, a brew pub, as I mentioned before, can sell its own packaged 
product from the brewery premises directly to the public or for off-sale consumption. As you've heard, brew pubs can contract with the Nevada wholesaler of its choice who can distribute their products uh, throughout the state at, to any retail location. So given this picture, brew pubs already operate in a manner that gives them a leg up on competing local bars, restaurants, and gaming facilities. SB 108 has several unintended consequences. Hey, sir, uh, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor if you can yes. start to wrap up. Absolutely. Yeah, okay, thank you. So just a few more points it, with the bill itself. The bill, section one of the bill changes the definition of special events to expand them to take place at, on 60 days per year. And just so that is understood, that's more than 26 weekends of the year or every more than every other weekend where, um, where brew pubs would uh, make sales outside of the three-tier system, sales that uh, are not subject to um, the type of regulation that all other liquor sales are subject to. Section 2 of the bill would allow brew pubs to transfer their product at any time to any location uh, operated by the brew pub owner, even if that location isn't a brew pub. Again, this is all outside of the three-tier system. It begs the question, why do brew pubs need to operate outside of the regula regulatory structure that applies for every other entity selling liquor in the state? And I'll, I'll conclude that the self-distribution provision is an invitation to every large multinational brewery in the world to open a brew pub in the state. It would have the consequence of uh, harming not just the, the jobs of the wholesalers that, that uh, we represent here, but it would, have a, would harm the local breweries because of their ability to transport um, vast, as I described, uh, in excess of 700,000 cases of beer um, per year outside of the three-tier system. Um, so it is our position. We strongly oppose this bill. We believe it's a bill drafted to cure a problem that does not exist under the Thank law. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not trying to cut you off, but we've got two more bills we have to hear. Um, we've got some people I, in the I, overflow I room, too. So I'm going to come back here, and if those of you at the table can please give me about a minute. Um, each, and then we'll go to uh, others who are in opposition here and anyone who's in opposition in the overflow room. So, uh, Madam Chair, Alfredo Alonso again. Uh, uh, just a couple of quick uh, uh, comments on, on what you've heard here today. Um, it's about a 25% or so markup that a wholesaler uh, ultimately makes uh, on the high end. So this 38% is probably including actual hard costs. Um, I don't know where that number came from because I've polled most of my folks and, and I would argue that if that number is too big and you don't like the way your wholesaler is doing their work, you can contract with one of the 86 other wholesalers that exist in the state uh, and, and, and do it differently. And, and so that, that is a really important point because you're not stuck with a wholesaler. In fact, this legislature actually made provisions to allow for brew pubs to go in and out of the system to find the wholesaler that works for them best. Um, secondly, one of, the, one of the issues that was brought up is, is the, the business plan. Absolutely. I mean, again, to claim that, that a small business is spending millions of dollars on, a, on, a, on brewery equipment and, and doesn't understand the rules. Uh, brew pubs are supposed to manufacture on premises. These tap rooms by law are not supposed to exist. And so th they're given a bar that in, in another section of the statutes explicitly says they can't own. So that's a really important piece as well. I think it's also important to note that the, uh, the Craft Brewers Association, both at the national level, has members like 
Anheuser-Busch and other very large members. At the local level, if you look at the Nevada uh, brew, craft brewers, their site even indicates that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, I, I believe it's uh, Gordon Biersch that's one of their members. Gordon Biersch is owned by a company that is located in 39 different states. These are not small businesses. And this does affect the big guy. The, the largest of the large would love to come in here. 5,000 barrels at a time on e at, at a location, that's a huge amount of beer. And so, and, and again, to Mr. Stone's, uh, Senator Stone's comment earlier uh, on amounts, that was a hard-fought compromise a few years ago that if we were going to go to 40,000 barrels total and 20,000 out of state, I'll, I'll be glad to put this in, in, in Nellis. Uh, this shows how the majority of the state's numbers are much smaller. I mean, we're talking about 10,000, 15,000 barrel limits for most brew pubs throughout the country. There are some big ones surrounding us in ABC states. So that's really important to understand as well. Thank you. Um, next, please, please, give me, give, me, give me about a minute. We got two more bills, okay? Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity this morning. Brian Walker with the Retail Association of Nevada. <clears throat> We are opposed. I want to thank the sponsor. We got into this very late, um, and she was very gracious talking with us. Um, but I want to caution um, some of what you've heard is kind of turning this into a big business, small business, out-of-state, in-state um, argument, and I think that's uh, unfortunate. We have a set of rules, um, and the Retail Association has always been for making sure that the playing field is level, whether that's online, brick and mortar, small, big, we want the same level playing field. Um, and so what we've done over the course of several sessions um, has put a big exemption uh, into this particular part of the regulation. Um, and if we're going to continue to have these discussions and figure out why the regs aren't working or why they are an impediment to economic development, um, then we need to have a more comprehensive conversation about the three-tier system. And for that reason, we are opposed to SB 108. Thank you. One more up here, and then I'll go down south. And um, please, about a minute apiece. Uh, I'd really like to try to wrap this up by 9.30, and we've got some folks in the overflow room. And again, if someone's already said what you're going to say, ditto is good. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Brett Scolari, S-C-O-L-A-R-I with Strategies 360 here on behalf of Breakthrough Beverage. Um, I will not belabor the points made by the three speakers before me. Um, I think just to frame this up, um, this is a policy decision to um, further... Um, give exemptions to the three-tier system um, and if you if you are if this body is going to go down that road um, We do really need to take a look at how narrowly tailored that um, Exemption is for these brew pubs and their satellite locations um, Because the integrity of the three-tier system is important to a lot of folks and you don't want to have those unintended consequences that the sponsor spoke about so I'm happy to work on language um, to see if we can come to a resolution um, and with that, um, we do oppose this bill as written. Um, and by way of introduction, uh, we have Kevin Wilkerson in the South. He's Director of Trade Development for the Beer Division for Breakthrough. And he can answer questions on um, operating in this space as a distributor if um, that is helpful to the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to go down south um, and really need to keep this to a minute. And anyone else who is here in um, Carson City, if you want to fill in the chairs that are up here, uh, and then we will go to the overflow room. Uh, and in broadcast, we'll go to, uh, to the phone lines. So anyone who's here in opposition, please fill the three chairs. Um, we'll come back up here uh, down to Las Vegas. Please, please, please try to, get to keep it to a minute. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, I promise. My name is Fred Horvath, H-O-R-V-A-T-H, and I'm the Secretary Treasurer of Teamsters Local 14, and I represent all of the people you see behind me, and a colleague represents the people in your room in Local 533, and this is very simple for us. The, the crack into the three-tier system is jobs, livelihoods for hundreds of working families in Nevada. Thanks. Anyone else down south? Then let's go to the overflow room. Any
Okay, we'll come back up here, and anyone who's in the overflow room, if you want to come to the main meeting room uh, now, and there's one chair available, but there'll be two uh, others just as soon as these two gentlemen finish. So if you're in the overflow room and you intend to testify in opposition, please come to um, this, uh, the main meeting room now. Yes, sir. Please go. Should I just ditto? <laughs> Thank you. The opposition. <laughs> um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Jamie Upster. I have been with New West Distributing for 10 years, managing the delivery department and fleet for the last seven. I currently manage 28 Class A CDL drivers uh, and a fleet of 75 assets. I asked... I ask you to vote no on Senate Bill 108. The passage of Senate Bill 108 would seriously impact the Department of Taxation's means to audit liquor compliance. The Department of Taxation currently audits wholesalers to maintain and possibly investigate excise and compliance issues. If passed, the bill will crip would cripple this auditing tool, leaving a monitored and dependable industry wide open for interpretation. Payment of taxes would be left to the honor system if wholesalers are bypassed. Current tax authorities and regulators will be scrambling to track production, taxation, and legality of liquor changing hands. Thank you, sir. Can you submit the rest of it in writing? Yeah, Okay. absolutely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Is anyone else here uh, in this room that's testifying in opposition? Please fill in the seats. And if you're in the overflow room and you intend to testify, please come and fill in the seats. Uh, and if I don't see that, then we'll go straight to the phones. Yes, sir. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Keith Dow, D-A-O, and I've been with Capital Beverages for 20 years as Director of Operations. Um, if passed, Section 1 of the Senate Bill 108 would allow a licensed brew up to set up any special events without a wholesaler or retailer. Since no wholesalers would be news, there is no way to confirm how much beer the brew pub is producing, transferring, or selling, and in turn ensuring the appropriate amount of taxes is being paid. Brew pubs also pay a much lower federal excise tax, giving them an unfair competitive edge on all restaurants, bars, and other event vendors. I ask you to vote against Senate Bill 108. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? I don't see anyone else here. Anyone else uh, in Las Vegas? I still see the same three people. Is anyone else? Uh, behind them going to testify yes okay yes my name's uh, my name's Andrew Boucher last name's B-O-U-C-H-E-R I'm opposed to this uh, because uh, besides everything else that was said it's uh, it'll definitely be a loss of uh, jobs for for us in the warehouse sales and drivers uh, uh, so I oppose thank you Thank you. Anyone else at the table? I just, uh, my name is Janetta Clary, C-L-A-R-Y. Um, actually, I just agree with the last three speakers, exactly what I was going to say. So ditto. Thank you so much. Uh, broadcast, let's go to the phones. We are currently taking testimony in opposition of SB 108. Yeah, if you'd like to testify in opposition, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. And, and while they're doing that, anyone down in Las Vegas, if you've already spoken, if you will leave the table and someone else can come up, that would be appreciated, okay? To the phones, back to the broadcast. Again, we are currently in opposition of SB 108. Test, test, testify in opposition. Please press star 9 now on your phone or raise hand in your Zoom window. Chair, you have no one in opposition at this time. Thank you. Um, we will move now to uh, neutral. Anyone here? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I see two people down in, in uh, Las Vegas. Yeah, and there's a third chair there. So if anyone else is in opposition and you want to speak, please fill in that third chair. Yes, sir, please begin. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Gabriel Townsend, T O W N. S-E-N-D, and I've been with uh, Nevada Beverage Budweiser for just about 17 years now uh, as a delivery driver. Uh, Nevada's independent beer distribution facilities employ thousands of hardworking Nevadans 
and countless communities across the state, from truck drivers to salespeople, inventory specialists, graphic designers, warehouse workers. Uh, these employees help brewers, suppliers, and importers build their brands and provide consumers with countless beer and other beverage choices. Make no mistake, Senate Bill 108 will be a job killer. Brew pubs will turn corporate as large out-of-state companies will also enter the state to compete against in-state businesses. If this bill passes, Nevada will be trading good paying positions with benefits and a future for minimum wage jobs. Thank you, sir. Can it's you submit the rest simple. in writing? Submit the rest of your testimony sure. in writing? Thank you, sir. Next. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, members of the community, community, my name is Alicia Allen. I've been with Nevada Beverage for 18 years. I'm an on-premise sales representative. I take care of golf courses, chain uh, restaurants, and small businesses also. Um, while the Senate Bill 108 is well-meaning, the legislation, it will be uh, different, uh, differential to thousands of Nevadans, including employees of the brew pubs. This measure will allow any out-of-state breweries with a brew pub license to manufacture in Nevada and operate multiple tap rooms without going through a wholesaler. This includes any large multiple national breweries. Section 2 of this bill lets brew pubs bypass the third tier system, allow, allowing them to deliver any look to any location that own or operated. Not only would this put thousands of local wholesaler employees at risk of losing their jobs, but local brew pubs employees as well. Thank you, ma'am. Can you submit the rest in writing? Can you submit the rest of your testimony in writing? Okay, thank you. And, and please please understand, we have to get through this. Um, and so um, anyone else here in opposition? I don't see any chairs occupied. Um, yes, one more. Any, anyone else who's at? Okay, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. Turn your, mic up, turn your mic on. I'm a rookie at this. Uh, Will Woolsey, Value Distributors, Fallon, Nevada. I'm one of the small wholesalers that are out there. I'm in opposition of this. Um, I brought my guys up here today. It's the same thing. Um, it is a ditto, but I would like to give a scenario as a small wholesaler. I have driven to Reno to get one keg to take to one event in my territory because these little beers, these beers matter to me. This is all volume to me. If you don't like your wholesaler, maybe look at a different wholesaler that has already been said. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and with that, uh, let's go to neutral. Anyone here in neutral, please come to the witness table here in Carson or in Las Vegas. Broadcast, we have anyone on the phones? We're neutral. And neutral, neutral is not coming and saying I'm against it. Neutral is neutral. You don't really have a position, so. Neutral. Broadcast. If you would like to testify neutral on SB 108, please press star nine now or raise hand in your Zoom window. Again, to testify neutral on SB 108, please press star nine now or raise hand in your Zoom window. Chair, you have no one neutral at this time. Thank you, and I don't see anyone neutral here. Uh, anyone neutral down south? Didn't see anyone. Okay, and sponsor the bill, Senator Wayne. We will be very brief. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator, members of the committee. Just to clarify a couple of things, there were comments made about these businesses not having a place in the law. I just wanted to clarify that a little bit. Um, from, our, from our standpoint, these establishments are part of our business organization and they have the same manufacturing and selling rules as, as our brewery site. So these are the same business organization and we see them as an extension of our brew pub, which, and, and not just that, these are licensed at the state and local level and what I'd like to provide for the co committee is sort of the jurisdictional ordinances that allow for these businesses to exist at the local level. They are licensed at that level and will provide that legal um, background and ordinance to the committee. Wendy Forrest for the record. 
Um, I do need to stress that wholesalers are not tax collectors. They are not tax auditors. As I mentioned previously, Craft House just went through a tax audit, and our wholesaler was never contacted for any information. The audit is done internally, and we do comply with all the state and federal uh, regulations for our excise taxes. Um, I also want to point out that we value our distributor, as I said previously, and our distributor still picks up our product every week and delivers that product every week. This is just a matter of an interfacility transport of the product we make to a business that we own. Um, and as a point of reference, uh, again, Nevada beer makes up 3% of total beer sales in the state. And of that 3%, uh, I think another 2% uh, currently hold uh, secondary tasting rooms. Uh, this would allow the industry to expand. Um, we're not taking jobs away from our drivers. We rely on them to deliver product in a professional manner on a weekly basis. We actually want to push more beer through the three-tier system. We rely on them heavily. Um, and uh, the, um, the statement that was made is that um, the uh, distributors are protecting us from large brew pubs moving in. They would still need to be under that 5,000 barrels sold at retail, and we welcome larger breweries to come in and add to our economy. Thank you. Um, I think it was said well. I want to thank all the people that made um, a call in. Um, I know that, as you heard from many of them, they were husband and wife duos, uh, and Wendy herself included in that group. Um, they are very small businesses, and the idea that there is an extension. This is just a quick Google of uh, how much some of these large um, distributors that we were talking about, um, you know, potentially I think there was like this, you know, extreme example of like big industry coming in and taking over and doing this. To give you an example, Craft House indicated that last year they transported 280 barrels. So they're not anywhere even close to that 5,000 barrel limit. And to put that in perspective, Miller Coors transported 85 million barrels annually. That's what they transport annually. So that is representative in that 3%. So 97% of all beer sales are going to these out-of-state companies. Um, and the distributors, would they would still have to go through this. Um, if this gave um, craft brewers any kind of advantage, um, we would see that already with some of the exceptions that we have to their barrel limits and their ability to produce product here in our state outside of that three-tier system. Um, and I know that those were hard fought for. To give you a perspective, we look at, see, I just looked, Googled up how many craft brewers are there in the Seattle area. And there are 250 alone in that city. Not that surrounding city, like the city of Seattle. Not like Edmonds or Everett or Bellevue or any of the surrounding cities, that city. Um, and we have 51 in our entire state. So I think that shows you that they are clearly struggling to expand the Nevada-made, Nevada-grown beer market. And um, I look forward, I have been talking with some of the opposition. I agree with them that we need to make sure that if this is nar narrowly tailored, to um, solve the exact problem that we have. So thank you for your time. And thank you. And with that, we will close the hearing on Senate Bill 108. And we'll just take a real quick break. If there's anyone here that is not testifying or interested in the other two bills, you can leave now um, or forever hold your peace. <laughs> so we're in recess.
hearing will come back to order, and we will now open the hearing on Senate Bill 78, sponsored by Senator Danyate. Uh, the measure makes various changes relating to property. So, Senator Danyate, please come forward and begin when you're when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Spearman, and good morning to the members of the Senate Committee on Commerce and Labor. Uh, for the record, I am Fabian Donate, and I represent Senate District 10 in Central East Las Vegas. I come before you to speak on Senate Bill 78, which seeks to address tenant protections and ways to improve the landlord-tenant relationship. Today, I am joined by Mr. Jonathan Norman, who is from Nevada Legal Aid, um, and we do have uh, Mr. Drew Wien, who we hope... Uh, walking in at the perfect time, actually, uh, who is the supervising attorney for Northern Nevada Legal Aid on LLT issues. Uh, as many of you know, last year I had the opportunity to run for my first election, and I got the chance to meet constituents from my district. It was through this experience that I was able to gather an insight on the issues that many of my neighbors faced and had been experiencing, particularly with listening to their issues through the COVID-19 pandemic. Over and over again, there was a unilateral theme that kept arising. Our housing crisis is a crisis, and we have a moral obligation to push for solutions that will uplift our residents. Nearly every door that I knocked on mentioned housing as a top-line issue. Their stories became part of a narrative that couldn't be overlooked. The rent is too high. Rental fees are not transparent. There are not enough housing units to support the number of applicants. My landlord evicted me, and I have no place to go. I don't know why I have to keep spending my money on application fees when I never get that money back. I am on a fixed income. I don't know if I will survive and if, if, I, if I keep going down this path. These are some of the comments that I heard on the campaign trail. And, I've, and of course, I would be remiss if I failed to mention that this issue is not just anecdotal from the experiences that I heard from my constituents, but also from a personal perspective. In fact, I distinctly remember a personal encounter that occurred not too long ago and the struggles that I faced as a legislator. When I was applying for housing in Carson City earlier this year, I ran into those very same issues with the unit that I was applying for here in our state's capital. Here were the requirements associated with the unit that I was trying to rent. Number one, my roommate and I had to pay a separate application fee, $50 each, and that amount would go towards processing our background checks. Number two, we had to pay an additional administrative fee of $150 not entirely sure what that meant or what have, would, would have been used for because it was never disclosed during the application process. And then third, the rent was listed as 1850 for two bedrooms. Pretty simple, nothing that stands out as a red flag. But on the same note, when I had mentioned to them that I was seeking a six-month lease given my tenure in the legislature, that's where the problems began. Our separate $50 application fees remained the same. The administrative fee increased from $150 to $700, and the rent was increased an additional $300 per month. If you do the math, that's about $2,000 worth that would have been spent on a two-bedroom unit, and I haven't even been uh, discussing the deposit that would have been expected as part of the amount that I would have paid to move in just into our state's capital. That's the reality of the situations that many families find themselves in today. And it's part of the reason why we're here to push forth on this legislation. Luckily for me, I have the disposable income to afford those encounters. But for many of the families in this state that can't afford that luxury, that's the reality. And it's a problem that we're trying to solve today. So at this time, I want to go ahead and pass the mic over to Mr. John Norman and his colleague to discuss the legislation and go by each of the sections to address any concerns. Chair, members of the committee, I want to thank you for hearing this bill today. My name is Jonathan Norman, N-O-R-M-A-N. -N. I'm the policy director for the Nevada Coalition of Legal Service Providers, which includes the Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada, the Senior Law Program, uh, Northern Nevada Legal Aid, which is where my colleague Drew Wheaton works as a supervising attorney, um, overseeing housing and consumer issues, senior law 
issues and the medical legal partnership. Prior to working at NNLA, he was a staff attorney at Nevada Legal Services, focus, focusing on housing and consumer issues in areas surrounding Washoe County. Um, and then we also, I also represent VARN, the Volunteer Attorneys of Rural Nevada. Um, I want to thank Senator Donate for bringing in this bill. Um, I also want to just thank uh, Senator Chair Spearman for, I think we were originally scheduled for last week and before the, uh, the snow ruined it, you had granted us an extra week because we were working with industry to try to hammer out some details. And we didn't, we didn't waste that time. Um, it does mean that we, we were working all the way up until yesterday evening to get um, some language hammered out so it, it might look messy, but that's reflective of all that work. Um, and, and I think that the um, Realtors Association is, is neutral on this bill, and although the Apartment Association is going to be in opposition today, I understand that I, I believe we are very close to reaching um, resolution with them as well. So when I walk through the bill, I'd like to, if it's okay with the chair, to approach it with uh, the sections in the original bill and then how we intend to amend them in light of our conversations with industry, if that's okay. So in the original bill, section one through five creates definitions that are used throughout the bill, defining such terms as cleaning deposit, grace period, and security deposit. In one of the amendments, we removed section three, which is, contains the definition of cleaning deposit. Section, section six addresses application fees, so that it is one prospective tenant charged and screened at a time with no ability for the landlord to use this as an income stream. It further defines what can be included in an application fee. This is a amended um, through a friendly amendment from Ovation Homes, and, and I think they'll be speaking in neutral today, um, and we'll flesh that out. But basically, if three adults are, um, are, are going to cohabitate a unit, they can have a fee for each of them if they have to run background for each individual. However, they cannot take the application fee from uh, a second family or third family in line. Um, and charge all those fees. They have to decide on that first application. Um, section seven governs fees a landlord can, f can charge when filing an eviction. Um, in our amendment, we removed subsection, subsection two. In section eight, which prohibits the selling or transferring the debt to a collection agency or reporting to a credit reporting agency unless the landlord obtains a judgment sets a statute of limitations for pursuing that claim at eight months, and then finally um, requires that if the, the amount is under the jurisdictional limits of Chapter 73 of the NRS Small Claims Court, that the action must be brought in Small Claims Court. Um, Section 9 requires the tenant to be notified in writing within f seven business days when the landlord changes broker or property management company and also highlights what must be in that notice. Um, an amendment to Section 9, we agreed to have that at 10 business days. Um, section 10 is, again, adding another defini definition section from this bill. Section 11 uh, provides an updated definition to normal wear and tear. In an amendment to Section 11, we removed in subsection 2 with consent of the tenant from the last um, sentence in that section. Um, section 12 broadly deals with what must be in a written agreement for renting a dwelling unit and adds that it must include the duration of the grace period, um, the fee for the late payment of rent, and fees, fines, and costs which are to be paid by the tenant and the purpose for which they are required. And in as an amendment, we removed uh, a, a redundant reference to the statute and then in section, subsection 5B, um, we allow, we allow that the fee disclosure can be in an, either on the, the front of the lease, the first page, or it can be an addendum signed by both the landlord and the tenant at the signing of the lease. Um, 
Sorry, I lost my place going back and forth between the two. Uh, section 13, subsection C, adds that the late fee must not be charged until the grace period set forth in the rental agreement is expired. Section 14 prohibits the rental agreement from requiring the tenant pay the landlord's attorney's fees, except that reasonable attorney's fees may be awarded to the prevailing party in a court action. Section 14 also um, limits the fees, fines, or cost um, to those in statute or actual and reasonable. And there was no amendment there. Section 15 prohibits a cleaning deposit from exceeding 15% of periodic rent, lays out what claims are appropriate to make against the security deposit when the tenancy ends. Um, Section 15 also requires the landlord to return or provide itemized written notice for the security deposit. And there are significant uh, amendments to Section 15. Uh, subsection 1B removes the language there regarding the 15% cap on cleaning fees, um, removes the language regarding cleaning fees when the government pays for the unit. Uh, it, returns the disposition of security deposit uh, to th the 30 days, which was originally in the statute. In, in talking with industry, that was important just for um, understanding, you know, what maybe the water bill or a bill was during that period. Um, section 15, subsection 4B, returns the additional liability for a landlord when they do not return or provide an accounting for the security deposit within the 30 days. Um, and, and that also removes the waiving of all claims when the landlord fails to provide an accounting or return to the deposit within 30 days. So that was kind of a, a, a trade-off that we negotiated with, with um, the, the realtors. Excuse me, can you explain that in plain language? Yeah, so originally if you don't provide an accounting of the security deposit within 30 days or return the security does deposit amount year, the landlord has damages that equal the security deposit amount. And then in the original language we had and waives all claims to the security deposit. And then we cut out a section of the NRS in our original bill that would have allowed the court to award additional damages. So in talking with industry, they weren't comfortable with the waives claims, but they were okay with that original additional liability that a court could could assign. So we we crossed off the, we amended out the language about the waiver and added back in the additional liability. Um, and then section 18, um, this, was an, this was an error in our original, original bill. It changes the time frame for notices of change in rent. In the original bill, it was 45 days and 15 days, so it's amended to the original statutory language, which is 60 days and 30 days respectively. And then section 20 adds that when a landlord fails to deliver possession, the landlord must refund other fees, fines, and costs that were paid to the tenant. So if, if they don't give possession at the beginning of the lease period, they have to return um, any money that the tenant has paid. Um, subsection 21 extends, in the, in the original bill, extends the no cause eviction timeline to 60 days from 30. So that's in cases where somebody is n not in a lease and is um, you know, current on their rent, and we, we had wanted it to be extended to 30 days. However, in an amendment, we removed that, so it'll be the original 30-day timeline. Um, I think we're having ongoing discussions with industry about um, where that, that could end up. Section 25, subsection C, clarifies when the agent of an attorney can serve notices. And then subsection 26 allows a landlord to be represented by the agent in an action in this chapter. And I, I would just add that, you know, Senator Donyade mentioned that this is what he heard knocking doors um, in, in, his, his dis, in his community. And I would say across all of our, the legal service providers, whether it's, you know, issues that are not to do with housing, like, you know, we represent kids in foster care and we have kinship caregivers struggling with housing. We have. Um, families entering the dependency abuse neglect system because of, of issues surrounding homelessness. Um, 
it seems to be the thread that cuts through all of our the clients that we serve um, at Legal Aid, and you know our practice areas are everything from family law, social security, children's attorneys project, record sealing, um, and all of our clients are being impacted um, by housing. And this bill does not, you know, it's not going to create more affordable housing. It's not lowering the cost of housing. What it is is providing some transparency around fees and then providing some what I think are meaningful um, tenant, tenant protections. So uh, at this time, I, I think we're ready to, for questions. Yeah, Chair Spearman, Fabian Dunyate, for the record. Um, again, we refer the committee members to look at the amendment that's on Nellis uh, for any questions that we might entertain. Um, as you know, this is a work in progress, and we're hopeful that we can continue negotiations with the community and, of course, uh, with different businesses throughout the state to reach a full agreement once this hearing is complete. Um, we want to extend our deep appreciation to Nevada Realtors for working on, alongside us to get this language right, as they currently are neutral on this bill with the conceptual amendments. Uh, we believe that they are instrumental partners in getting these negotiations done, and we hope that we can continue the good conversations in future years. And so at this time, uh, Chair, we'll go ahead and entertain any questions that you may have. Committee members, um, any questions? And please, can you limit those to, like, two? Okay. Your best ones. Senator Stone. Well, I did have a lot, but uh, I'll try to narrow the scope of That's the okay. questions. That's okay. You can take them offline. Okay. Thank okay. you. So um, it's my understanding, not only as a legislator, but as a landlord, um, and I would say a compassionate landlord, that isn't it written already in law that there's a four-day grace period after which you can put a 5% late charge? Uh, so if that's the case, why are we putting it back in the statute? Again, it just seems to be uh, very uh, confusing. Um, also... Um, One second here. So the grace period. Okay, so we have a grace period of four days. Um, you talk about uh, the maximum security deposit in your legislation, where it is uh, a month's, uh, potentially uh, the equivalent of a month's rent, and then two months uh, in rents, and that's the maximum, correct? Okay, so uh, in my case, uh, what we do, um, background checks, depending on what the credit score comes in, is indicative of what the security deposit is. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes it's less than a month's rent, and sometimes it's more than a month's rent, but it never is three times the month's rent. I'm concerned if you put this into statute and you've extended the time period under which a landlord can have to go through the hoops to evict and actually go to small claims court instead of having an attorney take it to a, a municipal court, um, that you may be making it more expensive for tenants to find housing uh, in Nevada because I think landlords are just going to default to the higher amount. That's I'm, I'm saying I would because I consider myself a compassionate landlord. In the past five years that I've been here, we've never done one eviction. We always work with our tenants. Um, so I have a lot more questions that I'll ask offline, but I, I just like to know why we're, we're duplicating existing NRSs, and are we not going to make it more difficult by virtue of this legislation to get people to come in? And by the way, I just want to say I commend you uh, for the application fees because I saw that as a lot of abuse. Uh, I'm glad that you amended it because it's not uncommon for me to have three college students to stay in one of my units, and we want to make sure that their collective the scores shows that they can afford the rent because we don't want to go through the eviction process. So thank you. Um, thank you, Senator Stone. Jonathan Norman, for the record. Um, I think, well, one thing that I think in the statute on the grace period is we require it to be um, in the lease, and, and I think that also a landlord could have potentially a, a grace period that's beyond what's in statute, and I think it's important for that to be in the lease if that does exist and not just be... Um, you know, in a conversation. Um, and then on the, I think having a discussion, and, and, and I want to say, you know, in talking with the realtors and the apartment associations, and I, I don't know if you may be a member of, of the um, Realtors Association, uh, you know, it's, it's obvious to me in our discussions that what we're trying to do is thread the needle where we're not harming 
the business practices of good landlords, right? And I would say the overwhelming majority of landlords and tenants are good people who are trying to do the right thing. Um, and so if, if there is language in the security deposit, around the security deposit, that there is a, is a harm that you're seeing as a, as a landlord for tenants, then I, I would love to have those discussions and maybe we can get to somewhere that's, you know, better. And then uh, lastly, so if a landlord does not return a security deposit within 30 days or provides a disposition of that security deposit within 30 days, not only will the court usually award without any further arguments, the tenant back their security deposit, but the, the, the judge can also order treble damages three times the security deposit, I believe. Isn't that correct? Um, Jonathan Norman, for the record, I'm going to defer that to my colleague, uh, Mr. Wheaton. Uh, Drew Wheaton, for the record, W-H-E-A-T-O-N. Um, no, it's, it's actually, um, the language is, is a little fussy, but um, it's the security deposit plus an amount up to the security deposit that was paid. So it would be basically double damages is at the discretion of the judge. Okay, thank you. This doesn't change that? Uh, Senator Stone, okay. offline. Okay. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Senator Buck. Thank you, Chair Spearman. Uh, I like portions of the bill, especially that you're in the lease agreements that you disclose uh, what all the fees are for. I think that's very important. Uh, when you sign a lease agreement and um, why after that, do you put the burden of small claims court litigation on, on the landlord? Um, Jonathan Norman, for the record, thank you for the question. Um, I think it's about finding the, the right forum and limiting the amount of potential um, attorney's fees and other fees that a tenant could, could pay. Most litigants, in whether it's landlords or tenants, are going to be not represented by an attorney, and that's, uh, um, to, in my mind, that is exactly the type of case that small claims court is designed to deal with. Um, and I'm uh, open to discussions around that, and I don't know um, if Mr. Wheaton has anything to add. Sure. Uh, Drew Wheaton, for the record. Um, Something that we often see uh, when we advise tenants, um, we end our, um, our relationship with them by saying things like, and now you need to check your credit history for the next two years in case your landlord doesn't sue you but reports your um, maybe a deficiency balance that may be uh, a correct deficiency balance or maybe an incorrect deficiency balance, but there's no forum for, um, for there to be a discussion about what is legal and, and not legal. So a lot of times what happens is, is that you know, a tenant may challenge and we may represent the tenant, we may win in court, but then they get, um, you know, a collection agency contacting them a year later saying you owe all of these illegal fees for maybe there was an illegal rent increase um, that a judge should have looked at. Maybe the um, the late fees were, were too high, you know, even in the, the lease that is there, the late fees can be too high. And if a landlord submits that to uh, to a collection agency, it looks like proof that, you know, everybody agreed that, that the fee was, was, uh, was a certain amount. Um, when, if it was put in front of a judge, a judge would, um, you know, would look at the law and see um, see what was appropriate in terms of what is owed. Additional questions, committee members? Yeah. So, um, Senator Donate, I'm trying to make sure I heard you. You said something about, was it $700? Can you? And I just turned my hearing aids up in case I missed something, okay? Thank you so much, Chair Spearman. Yeah, so again, this was an encounter that I had personally experienced applying for a rental unit here in Carson City. Uh, so I had to spend $50 as an additionally with my roommate, he had to spend $50. That was for the background check and for us to submit our application. In addition to that, uh, there was a requirement to pay 
an administrative fee, which was not disclosed to us until after we had communicated to, it, it was not broadcasting up as part of the listing for that rental unit. And then once we had notified them that we were looking to do it for the legislative se session, it went from 150 to 700. There was no justification as to why, I mean, you could have made the argument that because it's a shorter lease than the one year, you can double it, but there was no reason, rationale as to why it went from 150 to 700. And then that was also in addition to the rent increasing for the six term lease, to, to the six month lease as opposed to a full year. So that was the encounter that we had experienced. And uh, I mean, if you do the math, it's about $2,350 that would have been spent just in those six month time period because we changed it from a 12 month lease to a six month lease. And that's on top of what we would have to provide for the deposit and so forth, so. Um, and I think someone mentioned something about uh, one of the compromises is not going to, it doesn't necessarily have to, there's codes that have to be on the front page, but it can be. So why not the front page? Because mo most people don't, you know, go all the way to the back. And I, and I understand, you know, buyer beware, I get that. But if, if, if the lease, if, if everything that is required of the tenant uh, is indeed above board, why wouldn't you want that on the front page? Um, thank you for the question, Senator Jonathan Norman, for the record. You know, in talking with, and I, and I think, you know, this came from a friendly amendment from Ovation Homes, and they'll be um, testifying in neutral today, and I think the, the hang-up came with the form leases that they use, and they expressed that it would be difficult to have it on the front page. Um, so we made the, the compromise that if it had to be signed by the tenant um, and the, the um, landlord at the time of the signing of the lease, that that would be acceptable. But, uh, you know, obviously I think on the front page is, is, is better, and it's why it was in the original bill, but sometimes you have to give away things that, that you like in order to, to reach a consensus, and that was one of those, those items. Thank you, and that'll be a question that I will ask um, Ovation Homes too. Um, committee members, anyone else? Okay, thank you. You know, a couple of years ago, we talked about moving session down south because this is exorbitant rent, but I digress. Do you have anyone else that's going to present? Okay, so now we will go to uh, public testimony for those who are in support of Senate Bill 78. We'll go two minutes each and we'll have uh, 20 minutes total for each side. It's okay. Broadcast, is there anyone down south? Let's start up here in uh, Carson City, and if there's anyone down south, if the uh, cameras can uh, make sure, there we go. Yeah, start up here in Carson City, and then we'll go down to Las Vegas. Yes, please. Uh, good morning, Chair Spearman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Paul Katha, and I represent the Culinary Workers Union Local 226. Uh, I want to thank Senator Dunyate for bringing this bill forward and being so willing to work uh, with us as we negotiated with the industry. Uh, the Culinary Union is a member of the Nevada Housing Justice Alliance, uh, and we also want to thank the Senator for attending the tenant convening the NHJA held back in December. The COVID-19 pandemic hit cul the Culinary Union and our members incredibly hard. Uh, while many hospitality workers have uh, returned to work, uh, culinary members are still uh, suffering from the effects of the pandemic and struggling with uh, housing security. And I know I talk to our members all the time who are experiencing issues every single month with fines, fees, rent increases. Uh, Senate Bill uh, 78 addresses the predatory behavior that has been on the rise in the rental market in the last few years and which is da uh, damaging Nevada. Uh, as recently stated by Governor Lombardo's team at GOED, lack of affordable housing is one significant barrier to economic development in Nevada. Uh, this bill will protect Nevada's residents and its economy by making our housing market more affordable and predictable. Regulating application fees, connecting other fines and fees to cost, and requiring transparency around fees will help keep culinary union members in their homes. Landlords should make money off of rent, not off of unpredictable fees. If landlords are going to charge other fees to tenants, tenants deserve transparency about what their cost burden will be. The culinary union believes that every Nevadan deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. Nevadans should not have to decide between having food on the table or a roof over their heads. The culinary union urges the committee to support and pass SB 78. Thank you. 
Good morning, Chair Spearman. My name is Susie Martinez, and I am the Executive Secretary Treasurer for the Nevada State AFL-CIO. And on behalf of over 150,000 members and 120 unions, we, um, we support Senate Bill 78. It's no secret that we have been in a housing crisis here in Nevada. That's why it's critical that we expand the rights of tenants and protect them from malicious practices by landlords and property management companies. This bill would ensure that landlords are held accountable for exorbitant fees, that tenants aren't caught by surprise and put in tough financial spots. We must ensure that we can take this essential step towards making housing more accessible for every Nevadan. Um, you know, in my capacity now, I obviously, when I was an assemblywoman, I heard this many times as well, you know, the, the crisis of, you know, these fees and, and everything that was happening in the housing market. But now in my capacity as, as um, Secretary Treasurer, I would reach out to some of my affiliates. I would do my affiliate outreach. And it was, it kind of surprised me when they would bring <coughs> this, this um, issue to me because I was like, I'm the executive secretary of the AFL, right? But it was something that was affecting many of our members. One of our airline attendants, she, she uh, lives in New Mexico, has a home there, but she had to have an apartment here because she's also stationed here. She was um, complaining about that she had had to put 10 applications in to get an apartment. That's $1,000. I don't know how many of you guys have $1,000 just laying around, laying around. So that is one of the reasons why the Nevada AFL-CIO urges you to support this bill. Thank you very much. And Senator Donate, also thank you for this bill. Thank you. Um, my name is John Solomon. Um, I'm a small landlord. I own property in Fallon, Nevada, but I live in Reno, and uh, Mr. Daly is my senator. I'm speaking in support of this bill because we need to change our relationship with our tenants from being from them being a commodity to them being a customer. I treat my tenants as if they're customers. And it means that I don't have to evict people um, and I take care of the, of the buildings they live in. The most uncontrollable, uncontrollable aspect of my business is a transition from one tenant to another. The most expensive of these are when an eviction happens. This bill provides a, f a framework for better communication between tenants and property managers, having a more well-defined framework for the relationship between tenant and manager would empower tenants in some of the most important decisions they have to make concerning the quality of life. Due to a statewide lack of affordable housing, the result of evictions is often to be unhoused. Unhoused citizens are not only living in a brutalized life, and that result is something we need to avoid. I was a tenant for 30 years before I became a landlord. I never received a deposit back, not once. Thank you. Good morning. Yes, and we'll take you two, and then we'll go down to Las Vegas. Yeah. Yes. Good morning, Chair and Committee. Thank you for hearing me. I'll make it brief. Um, I am in support of I'm Aisha Goins, A-E-S-H-A-G-O-I-N-S, -S, and I'm here on behalf of the NAACP of Las Vegas, Nevada, and we are in support of this bill. We urge the committee to also support this bill. No one thought the poor was more undeserving than the poor themselves. This is a quote from the book Evicted by Matthew Desmond. It has been disheartening to have to talk to friends that I know, people that I see all the time, my community, about how they can't afford housing, how they can't afford to even look for housing, how the fees are not transparent, how they aren't receiving their fees back. I don't know how I really think that tenant rights should be a conversation consistently, but as it relates to this bill, I truly just think Senator Donate for bringing this because our tenants need rights, but they also need to housing. They need housing, and if they can't afford the fees to even look for housing, how do we expect for them to be housed? And so I urge you to support this bill. Good morning, committee. My name is Shane Piccinini, S-H-A-N-E-P-I-C-C-I-N-I-N-I. -I -I. I'm with the Food Bank of Northern Nevada, and I would like to thank Senator Donate for bringing this bill forward. As we all know, access to affordable housing is critical to being able to also help people maintain their food security, and we ask you to vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go down to uh, Las Vegas now.
Good morning. Uh, my name is Carlos Padilla. I am a pastry baker at Treasure Island and culinary union member for 29 years. I moved here over 30 years ago for the Las Vegas dream. I have seen Las Vegas grow to what it is today. I met my wife. We raised our daughter, who is 19 years old, and a son who is 16 years old. I've been a long-term renter in the Henderson, Las Vegas area. I remember when my rent was $1,200 for a three-bedroom house just a couple years ago. I was paying $1,675 just a few months ago, but recently renewed my lease, and now I'm paying $1,800 a month for rent. I asked my landlord why my rent has been going up so much lately, and they told me there is no law in Nevada that says the landlord cannot raise the rent to any amount they want. Every six months, the landlord does an inspection, which is legal, but I feel like it's an invasion of my privacy. During one of these inspections, they charged $150 just because my cat scratched a little bit of the trimming on the baseboard. When they were doing the inspection before I resigned my lease, I pointed out that I had paid the $150 and it still had not been fixed. This is the fourth lease I have signed where I live now, but at the most recent time, I had to reapply as if I were a new tenant. They made everyone over the age of 18 fill out an application fee, which costed $50 per person. Doing the, the ad, it's $150 to apply to a place where I have lived for many years. Adding insult to injury, my water and trash fees went up, along with having to add to my security deposit. The rent increases and added fees had tremendously impacted me financially. I am now budgeting between rent, food on a table, and other necessities. I would love to own a home one day, but the way things are going, I don't know if I can well survive another lease renewal. Thank I'm you, proud sir. that my union is fighting to make sure that people can afford to live in this city. I'm a proud union member of the, and this community. Thank you, sir. Can you Sorry. submit the rest of your testimony in writing, please? Thank you. Next, we're, we're going to try to keep it to two minutes so we can get as many uh, testimonies in as possible, okay? Yes, ma'am, please begin. Hello, my name is Yoris Ley Polo, Y-O-R-I-S-L-A-Y. I'm Casino Pora from the Las Vegas Street and Culinary Working Member. I have been living in Las Vegas for 20 years. I'm a single mom of 16 year old, Doug Gather, and Dora, and 12 year old son. I've been renting for the past two years because I had to sell my house on part of my divorce. I recently, my sister and nice and niece emigrated from Cuba, and they are living on my wife their way for the immigration paperwork to be complete. And I'm currently renting a three-bedroom apartment and the land, landlord raised to, to the rent by 150 this year. With the addition of the, of the two people, I feel like I'm paying too much for a small space. My niece don't have a, her own privacy and started to cramp it and a little uh, agitate. I want to stay in the same area because I don't want to stream all my kids. I was looking for a new place. I realized the rental maker has doubled on price. Not only has the rent going up, but the ad and fee that they place is tag and ridiculous. One place I'm looking, they asked me for six months rent on from, and the fees on top and security deposit. I have my daughter, my daughter have diabetes type 1. I, got, I had to get a medicine and some special food. Yeah, I don't see, yeah, I was supposed to save the money so and improve the life of my children. I think keep going up. It's not fair to the landlord can raise rent with no restriction or make improvement of the apartment that will justify the increase. I'm proud to be a culinary union member because my union is fighting for behind a working family. We, f we, fought, we fought for elect leaders and we'll go fight for behind a working family and put a first. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, can, you, can you submit the rest of it in writing? Get, submit the rest of your testimony, okay? Thank you so much. 
Good morning, Senator Spearman and committee members. My name is Barbara Paulson, B-A-R-B-A-R-A-P-A-U-L-S-E-N. I am a member of Boulder City United Methodist Church, which is a proud member of Nevadans for the Common Good. On behalf of Nevadans for the Common Good, a broad-based organization of 30-plus dues-paying congregations and nonprofits throughout Southern Nevada, representing over 100,000 people, we support SB 78. Since the start of this pandemic, our organization has been uniquely positioned to hear the challenges, disadvantages, and burdens that uh, tenants pace, face in the state of Nevada. Through our member institutions, we have talked to thousands of Southern Nevadans, walked through dozens of neighborhoods, and met with countless community leaders. We continually hear about the high cost and increasing barriers to obtaining affordable and fair lease agreements from across a diversity of residents. A consistent thread in the stories that we have collected has been about the unprecedented rise in application fees for a house or an apartment rental. This is an ongoing and costly burden for all families, including working professionals, foster parents, seniors, and students that limits our community in finding permanent and stable housing. We've heard from a clergy member that has been forced to pay hundreds of dollars for each application for a rental, with each application fee including additional costs for each member of his family, meaning that as a family of five, wife and three children, he is paying more for each application the most. Because each rental application that he has submitted requires these fees, he's limited in his ability to apply for housing and is considering moving out of state to obtain a lease and house his family. Uh, with these fees, in a very short period of time, he could be paying over um, one or two months' rent just to try to find a place to live. Senate Bill 78 addresses this issue specifically by limiting the number of application fees that can be received and by tying this fee to the direct and actual costs of processing an application. Application fees and deposits should not be seen as an additional revenue source for our landlords or property managers. They should merely be a mechanism to cover the direct and actual costs of background checks and repairs and also having it not be a re uh, revenue stream applies to security and cleaning deposits as well. Nevadans for the Common Good encourages you to support this bill, which reduces barriers and adds key protections for tenants who make up nearly half of our community. Thank you for Thank your time. Thank you. Uh, we'll come back up here to uh, Carson City. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Mindy Elliott with Flynn Judici Government Affairs, representing the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority this morning. And I think that we want to certainly thank uh, Senator Donate uh, for, uh, uh, for proposing this piece of legislation and certainly want to thank Messrs. Norman and Wheaton for working with the various stakeholders so we can come to a really uh, a good piece of legislation that will help um, our tenants and our landlords to understand the, the landscape in Nevada. As we have, um, we're certainly going to be having a lot of discussions as it relates to housing. Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority wants to be at the table and is available to provide any type of support and a conversation um, as needed. Uh, they will be providing a formal letter of support. Uh, it is not here yet, but as soon as it is, we'll provide it to the committee secretary, and we want to thank everybody this morning for hearing this bill. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Annette Magnus, and I'm the Executive Director of Battleborn Progress. We are here today in strong support of Senate Bill 78. First, I want to start off by thanking the Nevada Housing Justice Alliance. This coalition, which we are a part of, has worked tirelessly on behalf of Nevada tenants and the, un the unhoused population. Additionally, Legal Aid Plan and the Culinary Union have been leaders on this issue of affordable housing for many years now, and their work has helped us get here today, and we thank them for their hard work. SB 78 will do so much to help tenants across the state. Notably, this bill regulates the application fees fee process, which will become a major cost or which has become a major cost for people seeking rental units and a major revenue source for unscrupulous landlords. Additionally, SB 78 ensures that any fees that a landlord is charging will be communicated to the tenant and authorized by law. With a lack of housing inventory, high rents, and significant security deposits needed to find new housing, 
This bill prioritizes issues uh, tenants are experiencing every day in our state. We cannot sit idly by while the housing crisis grows more and more. That is why we are here today in support of SB 78. We urge this committee to support this important piece of legislation, and we thank Senator Donate for his work on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dakota Hoskins, uh, political director for SEIU, the Service Employees International Union, uh, Local 1107, and today we're urging your support for SB 78. Uh, our members work hard every day to put food on the tables and roofs over the heads of their families. At SEIU, we want justice for all, and that also includes housing justice. Uh, when a family is asked to pay hundreds of dollars in application fees, um, often for a house that already has a qualified applicant, or paying thousands in security deposits that they know will be reduced or completely taken away just for normal usage of their home, we feel that we are lacking that justice. Nevadans are being taken advantage of, and SB 78 serves as a first step to addressing it. SB 78 will combat surprise fees and rising application costs by requiring fees to be clearly listed in the agreement and limiting application costs to the cost of the service. SB 78 will ensure tenants are not penalized just for living in their house by preventing a security deposit from being held for normal wear and tear. SB 78 will allow for potential tenants to know if a house is actually even available by allowing only one application per unit. Right now, nearly half of Americans have less than $500 in their savings, but many Nevada and families are spending more than that in application costs, fees, and losing more than that in security deposits being withheld. If we want to address the housing crisis and make it more affordable for Nevadans to live here, we need to take the steps laid out in SB 78, and we urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And then we'll go down to Las Vegas. Good morning, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Serena Evans, and I'm the Policy Director for the Nevada Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. You'll see on Nellis that I have submitten, uh, submitted written testimony, so I'll be brief today. I just want to remind you all that housing access and justice is violence prevention. Senate Bill 78 is a necessary tool in keeping our community safe. Thank you. In Las Vegas, if there's anyone else here in Carson City in support, if you want to come, there's three empty chairs. And then we'll go to, after Las Vegas, then we'll go to the phones broadcast. So Las Vegas. Hello to everyone here today. My name is Jeremy Arroyo, and I'm here to speak about the abuse and deliberate retaliation from landlords and so on. The issue with many landlords is that they do not care and do not think about others. Many use tenants for self-gain and nothing more. No one should ever be in fear about losing their home and happiness. I have dealt with these issues myself, and it is one of the most hurtful experiences I have endured. Landlords should help their renter, not punish them by retaliating against them for unfortunate life events. Help them, be help them believe in them and give them the help they need by guiding them to helpful resources. Tenants should be treated like a customer, not an obstacle. Landlords are taking advantage of innocent civilians. Ask yourself, would you want to deal with these kind of people? and rob you of yourself? I didn't think so. Imagine having to deal with these kind of landlords on a daily basis and having to appeal to their insanity just to continue living. Imagine a loved one going through any of this. No one would ever want that, I can promise you that. SB 78 would help protect tenants from these situations and negative behavior. Landlords should always work together with their candidates and renters. There should never be a fee if you're not given a property. Application fees should always be returned if the candidate is not approved. Tenants should always be given a stable and feasible rent cost. That does not change throughout the tenancy. Deposits getting returned have also become a major issue. If there is no damage to the property, why damage and steal from the tenant? I personally have been a victim of landlord retaliation. He robbed me of all my basic human rights that range from countless wrongful and retaliatory evictions to putting my life in jeopardy for a few hundred dollars. SB 78 would protect tenants from landlord retaliation. Another issue that I want to point out is that the cost of living has increased at an alarming rate, Sir? and we all need to help. Sir, yeah, two minutes, so can you submit the rest of it in writing, please? Sure. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool, good morning, uh, Senator Spearman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Quentin Savoy. that's Q-U-E-N-T-I-N. S like Sam, A like Apple, V like Victor, W-O-I-R, 
and I'm coming to you today in my capacity as the president of the Las Vegas NAACP. We're really grateful to Senator Donate for bringing this piece of legislation forward. Uh, as, as a previous member of the Nevada Housing Justice Alliance, we know that these issues of tenants' rights have been consistent in our state since uh, well before the pandemic. So I'm really grateful that we are able to have this discussion about how we're able to protect more Nevadans. The International De Declaration of Human Rights states that housing is a fundamental human right and it's just lost on me how we as humans have failed to make this the one thing that's most accessible for all of us. Because no matter your political affiliations or, or loyalties, we can all agree that we want our families to grow up in a home and we want them to live whole, full, thriving lives. Yet in Nevada, we have cruel and punitive measures in place that keep the most vulnerable amongst us from accessing housing. There are tons of studies from the most illustrious institutions and foundations, and they have all concluded the same thing, that high rental costs and punitive and excessive fees impact communities of color, mostly black women. Now what we're asking for in this bill is just one piece of a broader puzzle because it impacts someone's ability to find their home. But when you reduce the barrier around fees, then you actually increase tenants' rights. What we're asking for isn't hard. Fee transparency, that's democracy. Notice of increased fees, that's democracy. I always hear from, from folks on the other side by saying we don't want to harm folks, but why are we hiding basic information that would allow our families to make more informed decisions. Expedited deposit returns, that's necessary when families get put out of their homes to find their future homes. Creating parameters around application fees, that just makes sense. We're not talking about hampering business, we're talking about seeing the humanness of our neighbors. We strongly urge support for this legislation and thank you for your time. Respect to the chair and also to the Senate committee, uh, for the record, my name is Bishop Derek, that's D-E-R-E-K, Rimson, R-I-M-S-O-N. And of course, I also represent uh, in the AACP uh, as the chair of the Political Action and Social Justice Committee. Uh, again, thank you to the senator that has drafted and submitted this essential bill concerning housing. It is, it's a, uh, a needed bill because, uh, as we all know, uh, all uh, Nevadans are literally re rebooting and rebounding from a very tumultuous pandemic. And with that being said, housing is important, it is necessary, um, and uh, people should not have to always worry themselves about if they're going to have a roof over their head due to surprise fees and added costs. Uh, that is making housing very, very unaffordable, especially for the black community, uh, which really suffers economically. Uh, and so we are thankful to the senator for submitting this bill. We stand behind this bill. We promote this bill. And, of course, we need this bill to become le legislation and law. Thank you. Going to go to the phones now, and then we'll come back up here to Carson City Broadcast. Anyone on the phones? Testify in support of SB 78. Please press star 9 now or raise hand in your Zoom window. We have anyone Participant Joe Vondo, please press unmute to give testimony. Sorry, Chair, we have lost that one. Moving to the next caller. Hello. My name is Adrian Lowry. I'm an organizer with Northern Nevada Democratic Socialists of America. We're a member of the Nevada Housing Justice Alliance. I live in Senate District 13, and I support this bill. My housing is secure at this time, but most of my family members have tenuous housing situations. When my mother or my sisters have to move, it is a family endeavor. In Northern Nevada, we have to move often. Every year, the rent increases more than it's said sustainable and the cheaper apartments run out, uh, turn out to be dangerous slums. We have uncovered dangerous mold at apartments 
and we have seen unmaintained electric wires set fire to bushes right outside the window. My family should not have to pay exorbitant application fees and security deposits as they move from apartment to apartment looking for a home that is not a danger to their well-being. Eliminating these extra fees will make it easier to find safe housing and disincentivize exploitive slum housing practices. I know we're not the only people who have this experience. Um, currently, these application fees are being abused, certainly. Um, so I, that is why I support this bill. Thank you. Broadcast, do we have anyone else? Great. Yes, greetings, everyone. My name is Gerald S. Mays, that's M-A-Y-E-S, and I am a husband and father of four. I am also a 100% disabled combat veteran of the United States Marine Corps, and I serve my community as the Veterans Affairs Chair for the NAACP in Las Vegas. I served a 12-month tour in Iraq with the Marine Corps Union Station in Nevada. Many of those same veterans I serve with are active participants in our community today serving as government employees, community service leaders, financial professionals, and even elected officials in our state. We at the NAACP support Senate Bill 78 and urge you all to join us in support as this bill will allow many of the fixed-income disabled combat veterans in our state to not be blindsided by fees and charges left to the discretion of the landlord. As it sits today, a landlord is allowed to charge fines, fees, and hold deposits of maximum amounts that they choose without a real cause or reason. This bill will provide the basic living protections we owe the veteran service men and women that represent 10% of our state. Thank you for your time. Broadcast, let's pause just a minute. I'm going to come back up here to Carson City, and uh, then we'll go back down to Las Vegas and then come back to the phones, okay? And, and for those who are uh, waiting online, if you'll just do me a favor, just pay attention to uh, when your phone is unmuted so we won't have to spend time trying to get you to talk. So, yes, sir. Hello, Chair Spearman and members of the committee. My name is Tony Ramirez. Uh, that's T-O-N-Y-R-A-M-I-R-Z for the record. Uh, I'm the Government Affairs Manager for Make the Road Nevada. We are a, a Nevada-based organization that focuses on elevating the power of working class immigrant communities in every community around the state. I'm here in support of SB 78. Uh, our membership, along with many other Nevadans, have been victims of the predatory practices, practices ex excuse me, of some landlords and victims of the lack of regulation in the rental market. This bill would rein in those who seek to profit off application fees, address transparency on costs, and ensure tenants are receiving their deposits in a timely manner. As Governor Lombardo said, right now, home does not mean Nevada to many people, to as many people as it could or should. SB 78 would help make that a reality. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go back down to Las Vegas. Hello, for the record, my name is Manuel Ayala. Uh, that's A-Y-A-L-A. -A I'm a community organizer uh, here in Las Vegas. I'm actually speaking um, with a testimony on behalf of Umberto Sandoval, who could not be here. Um, he be, so my name is Umberto Sandoval. I am new to Las Vegas Valley, and in the short time I have been here, I have already experienced what it means to be a renter in Nevada. It means paying exorbitant rent, rents and embracing myself for hidden excessive fees with little to no notice from landlords. The only contact that I have received is often just to remind me about the high late fees, a fee of 80% of my total rent, nearly doubling the $1,700 that, are, that is already difficult to, to afford. My landlord has already made made it so that the only way to pay rent is by using cashier's checks. This creates an additional unnecessary burden that often delays my ability to pay rent. By passing SB 78 and cracking down on these unnecessary fees, my neighbors and I will no longer be subjected to the exploitative system that so many landlords have created in Nevada. Landlords should not be able to hold such high fees over our heads while adding more and more obstacles to paying rent. We need to pass SB 78 to end the exploitation of Nevada renters and hold these landlords accountable. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Shanze Aslam, A-S-L-A-M, and I am the Economic Justice Program Manager with the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada, here in support of Senate Bill 78. First, we want to thank Senator Dinate for carrying on the fight for tenant protections from the Senator Raddy's bill from last session. Plan is a founding member of the Nevada Housing Justice Alliance, the only coalition to represent tenant voices at the Nevada legislature. 
I work with tenants and residents across the state of Nevada. As the cost of rents continue to rise, many community members have been forced to relocate. We often hear from community members that application fees and the inability to receive their security deposit back are some of the biggest barriers for securing housing. Application fees need to be limited to actual necessary costs and landlords should be limited to only one fee per available unit at a time. We are concerned that the predatory landlords are abusing the fact that application fees are so arbitrary. SB 78 would create clear par parameters for this process so tenants are not having to waste their hard-earned money on what they have set aside for security deposit and application fees when a landlord might have no intention of renting out the unit. Furthermore, tenants need to get their security deposits back in a timely manner in order to secure new housing. As folks are con continuing to be priced out of their homes, they need the boost of a security deposit to find a new place to live. There also needs to be clear standards for what can be taken out of a security deposit and what can be charged for cleaning when tenant moves out. They, we need to clarify the language of reasonable wear and tear so that landlords cannot abuse the current vagueness anymore. And landlords need to be able to de demonstrate how damage was beyond reasonable wear and tear and the fault was of the tenant. Tenants in Nevada need to be protected. We need transparency and we need accountability of unscrupulous landlords. I ask that you pass SB 78 to protect Nevadans and pra from practices that can have a profound impact on their lives. Pass 78 and watch us thrive and rejoice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's oh, go hello, to- good morning. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll take you and then we're going right to the phones, okay? Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, okay. Chairman Spearman. Uh, good morning, Chairman Spearman and members of the community. Um, for the record, my name is Sean Navarro, N-A-V-A-R-R-O. Uh, I want to thank Senator Donate for bringing this bill forth. Um, as an organizer of Las Vegas Democratic Socialists of America, we've done some uh, tenant organizing and canvassing units. Uh, and when we talk to folks, there's a real sense of, of folks uh, really feeling beaten down, to be frank. They, they feel they have no recourse against their landlords. And to be honest, that's true. They don't know what to do um, uh, if their landlord is abusive to them, if they're charging exorbitant fees. Um, it's a very common story that folks will say, you know, my rent went up $250, the front gates broke in, and we have, you know, we have bugs, but what can I do? I'll go somewhere else, and they'll charge me just as much. Um, I, I feel folks are losing faith in the system. They're losing faith that uh, not only that they'll be able to find affordable uh, apartments, let alone be able to afford a house, um, they're losing faith in a better future. Uh, housing is more than just where you live. It's about it's about your home. It's about where you live. It's it it brings security to folks. So I think this bill brings about very necessary changes, and it gives tenants a sense of protection. It gives them um, some recourse against abusive landlords. Thank you all so much for your time, and uh, thank you again. Broadcast. We have anyone on on the phone in support? Thank you, Chair. Queuing the next caller now. Uh, good morning, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Chastity Martinez. I'm a resident of Reno and Senate District 15. I'm also a organizer with Faith in Action Nevada, which is also a member of the Nevada Housing Justice Alliance. I'm also a Christian, and out of my faith, I believe in the dignity of all people and believe that housing should be a human right. I'm also a renter, and although I'm very fortunate with my current renting situation, I know that if I were to move elsewhere in the community, that might not be the case. And so without some of these basic tenant protections, I'd only imagine the lack of security I'd feel um, and with the difficulty for other folks to that have limited housing options and limited income. I also volunteer with various churches and charities that provide direct service to a lot of unhoused populations and those at risk of becoming unhoused. Without these protections, folks are fo forced to pay nearly thousands of dollars just to move into a place. And I believe this bill is a proactive approach to prevent more of our neighbors from falling through the cracks and becoming unhoused. And while there are more protections definitely needed beyond this bill, I think this is a good first step to really uh, get people housed and keep people housed. So I encourage you to please uh, support SB 78. And thank you, Senator Doñate, for your leadership on this bill. Thanks. Uh, broadcast, we're gonna take uh Another call from uh, those who are on the phone, and we have run out of time, actually we're a little bit over. Um, and so those of you who are on the phone, you did not get a chance to testify. If you please submit your comments in writing, 
uh, and I'm only trying to do this because we have one more bill to, to be heard. So I certainly appreciate your understanding. So we'll take one more call, and we'll go back down to Las Vegas. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. I am Tamara Favors. I am T-A-M-A-R-A-F-A-V-O-R-S. I am speaking for a community member, Dana Diaz, D-I-A-N-A-D-I-A-Z. She is a community member and resident of Las Vegas, living in Senate District 3 in this uh, Assembly District 10. I ur she urges the committee to pass SB 78 on tenant protections. Having tenant protections gives her the opportunity to have a better understanding of type of fees being placed. Previous landlords have not been transparent on types of fees and when they are fixing and cleaning the apartment. She actually moved into an apartment that was not clean and her bathtub has a hole in it. Currently that the hole is still there and she is not able to soak in it um, to relieve her, her physical ailments. Unfortunately, she had to threaten to, to withhold rent to, um, for the landlord to fix and replace her heater and AC. Even when the landlord attempted to pr replace the heater and AC it was still the wrong size furthermore transparency needs to be um, need, it needs to be a change of ownership to ensure tenants are aware and can submit maintenance requests to new owners and clear communication she urges you to pass SB 78 that would deeply impact her livelihood and her neighbors thank you for your time and consideration Diana Diaz thank you uh, let's go to the phones now one more caller broadcast Thank you, Chair. Queuing at the next caller now. And while you're doing that, I'm just going to ask those Good who morning. are in Las Vegas, uh, if you are in support, I uh, see everybody leaving, but if you're in support and you're still there, uh, just stand so we can see uh, how many people are there. Support. Okay. All right. And for the sake of time, uh, if you'll be seated for the sake of time, I'll just see anyone who's there stand if you're in opposition. Okay. Okay, broadcast. Next caller. Uh, good morning, Madam Chairman Osterman and members of the committee. My name is Edward Goodrich of the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, 363. We're the Reno Stagehands. We're in full support of SB 78 and ask the committee to support it as well. For our members who rent, this market is hard enough. It does not need more bag fees like the airlines charge to enhance their bottom line, application fees, non-refundable pre-deposit fees, holding fees, resort fees, outrageous late fees, and in a recent video I saw on YouTube, tipping your landlord because they're your landlord and deserve to be tipped for delivering things that are required by law for owners to provide renters. I can mail, I'll be mailing a link to this for the committee, to the Secretary of the Committee. This is an abuse of renters. It's a profiteering and uh, taking advantage of those in need. It's a growing problem. SB8 is uh, needed now. I thank the committee for its time. Thank you. Um, that's, we're going to close out the um, public comment and support. And for those of you who do not get a chance to um, testify in person, please submit your testimony in writing, and it will become a part of the record. And so at this time, we're going to move now to opposition. Um, and we'll have the same rules in place, two minutes per, and we'll do 30 minutes as well. So anyone here in... Carson City in opposition. And anyone in Las Vegas in opposition? Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Roberta Olinger Johnson. I'm an attorney member of the Creditor Rights Association of Nevada. We rise in opposition to Section 7 and 8 of SB 78. Sponsors aware, and I believe that we have communicated the reasons why through our lobbyists. I do have personal connections to this bill as well. In December, I had a family member who was sheltering from a domestic violence incident, and we were not able to find her substitute housing. I'm currently looking for housing for my elderly father, and I'm not really sure that this market's going to make it. So I, too, understand the pressures on tenants, but I don't believe that Sections 7 and 8 get us there. 
Now, from what I understand this morning, 7.2 has already been removed, so I'm not going to address that. However, we are directly opposed to Section 8. First, we find that we believe that consumer protection is best served when you have licensed, regulated, and insured individuals doing the tough jobs. And evictions and collections are tough jobs. That's why we use constables for evictions and process servers for service of process. And we all know that being financially stressed and owing a lot of money and being owed money can be volatile. And that's why we, as third parties, um, are in the best position to do this. We are licensed and insured. Professional collectors and attorneys both have liability under the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act and regulatory complaints, both with the bar and with the FID. They are background checked and insured. Landlords, on the other hand, are not required to have background checks or insurance to do their own collections. Now, as many times as I heard the words cruel, punitive, predatory, deliberate, abuse, retaliation, malicious, and unscrupulous, I think you guys need us in the mix because we really do bring down the temperature in the room. We do, <laughs> we do things like we accept payment arrangements, settlements, and workouts. Uh, we believe that provision 8.1 pro pro prohibiting the uh, ability to credit report damages everyone except the non-paying tenant. In my family's situation, the person experiencing the domestic violence situation would have her payment history devalued as against non-paying tenants. Excuse me, ma'am. I do want to address uh, the point. Yeah, ma'am, ma'am. Yo, yes, ma'am. You know, you're over two minutes, so if you can submit the rest of your testimony in writing, I certainly would appreciate that. Okay. Uh, I do want to just really quickly say we do oppose shortening the statute of limitations. It prevents workouts and rushes evictions. Thank you. Thank I you. will submit in writing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll come back up here to Carson City and broadcast. Get ready because we'll come to you next. Anyone who's on the phone. Yes, sir. Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Uh, for the record, my name is John Sandy, S-A-N-D-E, uh, here today on behalf of the Nevada State Apartment Association. Uh, to uh, start, uh, I want to thank Senator Duniate and uh, his leadership on this bill. Um, housing is critical in our state, and these issues are of utmost importance, and the Apartment Association is dedicated to participating in good faith in these important discussions throughout the session. Uh, this bill is uh, no different. Uh, we've engaged in very robust uh, conversations with uh, the proponents, and I am very excited of the, the progress that has been made. And I, I, I agree with the, the statements uh, that the proponents have made that we're all working towards uh, protecting good tenants uh, and protecting good landlords in this state uh, in, in an effort to create good policy. Um, I'm encouraged that we can continue these discussions uh, and, uh, and come, come away with a, a really workable bill that we would be happy to support. Uh, with that said, we do have a, a few issues uh, that we would like to continue working on with the proponents, and uh, they've expressed a willingness to, to continue that dialogue, and we're very uh, thrilled to, to engage on that. Um, I, I really appreciate the comments uh, regarding the disclosures of the fees. I think a lot of the supporters have said that that's an important issue, and to that we wholeheartedly agree. Uh, also, that tenants should know what the fees they might be responsible for, or, well, and know the fees that they might re be responsible for. I think the disclosure of those on a single page makes a lot of sense, uh, something that the, the tenant will sign. Um, it, it, it happens in how other areas of housing. It happens when you buy a car. Um, I think we, this is something that we, uh, we agree with and we think is a good, good component of the bill. Um, also, limiting the application fees. Uh, somebody shouldn't be paying for background checks if they if their background check isn't run. And if uh, landlords are trying to make profit centers out of these application fees, we absolutely wholeheartedly agree. Um, so uh, I, like I said, I mean, we uh, are here uh, wanting to have these discussions. We're here in good faith. I know that the proponents have been here in good faith and, and we feel listened to. I wanna say that at least with me and engaging these conversations with really smart attorneys in the room, um, I, I feel like they're taking our concerns and really uh, listening to those and um, really, really happy with that. And so, uh, unfortunate that we're here opposed, but uh, it is part of the process and uh, we're hopeful that we will uh, craft something really great for this committee to take a look at. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, broadcast, anyone on the phone lines in opposition? Thank you, Chair. If you would like to testify in opposition of SB 78, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue.
Thank you, Chairwoman Spearman. My name is Wes Rizard with American for Prosperity Nevada. That's R-O-U-Z-A-R-D. On behalf of American for Prosperity Nevada and thousands of activists, I urge you to oppose Senate Bill 78. But I will say, the bill sponsor, Senator Zanyate, has done a remarkable job in bringing this issue forward. It is a very serious issue um, related to the housing market and rentals. But we do believe it creates some unintended consequences with the severe restrictions imposed on landlords. The adverse effect on already a high rental market will disincentivize more rentals entering the market, which will lead to higher prices and cause more housing affordability issues. And I believe Senator Stone shared that. Should SB 78 pass as written, small individually owned properties such as single family homes, casitas, condos, multi duplex or tri triplex, may decide that it just makes more sense to sell because of the additional risk and costs incurred, whereas large corporate-owned apartments would be able to afford and assume the risk that this creates. This would disrupt the supply chain of housing and therefore lead to higher prices as our state continues to grow and demand intrinsically increases. This bill, I believe, is unfair and it affects families who may be using rentals as an economic vehicle to supplement their income and provide for themselves Although we agree that renters need help and things like excessive fees and these predatory practices that we've all come to recognize here are an issue, we need to also ensure we do not severely leave owners unprotected and at risk of bad actors who could simply use this to avoid fulfilling their contractual obligation. Transparency is important. We look forward to continuously working with Senator Dunante and stakeholders on this issue. We believe reining in reform on burdensome housing, land use, and zoning regulation will help unlock economic opportunity, and we urge you to vote no on SB 78, and we're also looking forward to working with the Senator so we can get to a yes and support this because we need this for our state. Thank you very much, and yes, home means Nevada. Let's make it happen. Thank you. Anyone else broadcast on the phones? Good morning. My name is Matt Schriever, S-C-H-R-I-E-V-E-R. As a small business owner, I oppose SB 78 for reasons that those in support of the bill have not even addressed today. Section 8 of this bill would disproportionately affect small businesses that are already struggling to find resources, finances, employees, and most importantly, good tenants. SB 78 prevents landlords from assigning delinquent rent accounts to collection agencies or reporting it to credit until after the landlord obtains a judgment. Small landlords don't have the resources to invest in the skip tracing abilities to locate tenants who skipped out on rent. It is more practical to assign these accounts to collection agencies that have already invested in the expensive framework of skip tracing tools. SB 78 also lowers the statute of limitations to file a lawsuit from six years to eight months. And again, your typical landlord does not have the ability to find these tenants that have skipped out on rent within that eight months. This would have the negative consequence of overburdening the courts with a flood of extra lawsuits rather than giving the parties time to try to resolve this matter informally without the need for extensive litigation. In the months after a tenant skips out on a rental, the landlord's focus should be on mitigating their damages by rehabilitating the property damage to the unit and finding a new qualified tenant to lease the unit to. And less concerned about spending money to find, serve, and file a lawsuit simply to meet an eight-month deadline to file that lawsuit. Finally, if a landlord does file a lawsuit to try and obtain unpaid rent and deliberate damage to the property, SB 78 requires that the overwhelming majority of these lawsuits would be filed in small claims court. Small claims court does not allow for an award of attorney's fees, so the landlord will once again get the short end of the stick by having to pay for an attorney out of pocket and, not, and then not having those fees awarded, even though the rental contract says they are recoverable to the winning side. While there might be good, other, good aspects of SB 78, the problems with the provisions I've outlined overshadow those good aspects. These provisions do not have anything to do with Senator Donati's story for introducing Thank this you, bill. sir. These Thank you, sir. Hello. Thank bill. you. Otherwise, Hello. Hello. Slow down so you can hear me. Thank you. You've reached two minutes. If you can submit the rest of your testimony in writing, certainly would appreciate it, okay? Broadcast, do we have anyone else on the line? We are currently still taking testimony in opposition of SB 78. If you'd like to testify in opposition, please press star nine now or raise hand in your Zoom window.
Hi there, my name is Mary Christ, M-A-R-Y-C-H-R-I-S-T. I'm a single mother of two children, school-age children, receiving zero uh, assistance with um, any type of benefits as well as child support. And it is becoming increasingly hard as a mother to provide a roof over my children's head. Um, I'm in District 10, and I support SB 78 because not only has my rent doubled, my fees to get a new place that I can't afford are astronomical. I can't afford to move. Um, in particular, fees that are transparent, such as um, pre-COVID, I had uh, on-site security, and they took that away and imposed a $25 CAM fee. With taking away the security, my place has become less safe, and now they're to renew. I actually have to pay $50 CAM fees with the renewal. Again, not substantiated by anything that the apartments have done. It's not safer. It's actually become less safe. And um, I think these these fees need to be validated with actual proof that they're going to improve the life in, of the tenants and not just. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So your uh, testimony is in support? Your testimony is in support? In support of 78, yes. Okay, so yeah, we're yes. so we're, we're in opposition now, but okay, we'll we'll make sure that it gets recorded and please submit it in writing. Anyone else on the phones in opposition? Chair, you have no more callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. Anyone uh, in Las Vegas in opposition? In Carson City. Okay, we'll move now to neutral. And if there's anyone in Las Vegas testifying neutral, please uh, take the chairs up front. And anyone here in Carson City, if you're neutral, there's two empty chairs, and they're yours if you want them. Good morning. You can't take them, but yeah. Very well. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Mackenzie Warren Kay with McDonald Carano, appearing in neutral on behalf of Ovation and also Manufactured Home Community Owners Association. Chair, I will be brief, but since I'm appearing for two groups, asking for a bit of grace on the two minutes, um, thank you. We have submitted two friendly amendments. Um, I'll start with Ovation. We believe transparency from the outset of the landlord-resident relationship sets that tenancy up for success. This is why we worked with Senator Dignate, um, started in the interim, and as Mr. Norman said, late last night, um, the, the two amendments that were accepted um, are part of the friendly amendment that Mr. Norman walked you through. They touch on two sections, that's section 6 and section 12 in the original bill, which are now the new section 5 and the new section 11. A little bit of context on the uh, new section 5 and the friendly amendment, just to add a bit of the mechanics of, of how it works. Once a, an application is accepted on a unit from a, a potential tenant 18 years and up, that unit is taken off the market and it's put in a, a pre-lease hold. So the amendment reflects the practice that once an application is submitted, a landlord cannot then accept multiple applications from hypothetical um, tenants standing in line. This stops the predatory practice of, of turning the application process into a profit center. Um, the second, Chair Spearman, you had a question about new Section 11, which is um, adding language to allow the, the clear and conspicuous fees to be listed in an addendum. Uh, the reasons are twofold why I, I believe the sponsor and legal aid was comfortable th with this. The first being um, just fitting it all on, on the first page of an eight and a half by 11, in addition to all the requirements of information that must be contained on that first page, can be a problem, um, particularly if that tenant wants to customize their living situation. That brings me to the second point. The addendums work well, let's say if a resident had a pet, they maybe wanted to rent a garage, maybe a storage unit. Those agreements would exist in addendums that contain all the details and require landlord-tenant signatures. So there's assurances given that the landlord um, and tenant both have eyes on that piece and that all tenant and the roommates are signing that to understand what, what the agreement is that they're entering into. 
So that does it for ovation, so I'll take that hat off and put on uh, Manufactured Home Community Owners Association. This is a friendly amendment that was not covered um, at, at this, the start of the bill introduction. MHCOA represents um, a little more than half of all parks in the state. And uh, generally, the landlord-tenant relationship in manufactured homes is, is uh, regulated by NRS 118B. We do have a small percentage of uh, residents that would fall under the NRS 118A. This, this is a, a percentage that is in the single digits. And given Senator Dignate's aim is really to reach multifamily, he was amenable to carving out the applicability of SB 78 to manufactured homes. That was submitted in a conceptual uh, amendment that you'll see posted on Nellis. Um, so again, happy to appear before you all in neutral on behalf of both Ovation and Manufactured Home Community Owners Association. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Anyone else here in Carson City? Is that someone sitting at the table in Las Vegas? No? Yes. Go to Las Vegas. Uh, yes, my name is Warren. Last name is Williams. My activist name is Farrell X. And I am neutral on this because I feel that oftentimes when bills are presented, they lack the inclusion of all the issues. And that there need to be far more town hall meetings, be sure that the people's voices are being heard and recorded and acknowledged of all the many issues that come into play. For instance, just the very thought of eviction often cause psychological distress to the individuals or to the families that's impacted by it. Certain responses from landlords even aggravate people to go into rage because they can't believe that if they be a long-term tenant, one month they get behind and then they're getting eviction notices. There needs to be more of a bill for tenants' protections than simply stated as tenants' rights. Tenants need to be protected so that many of the issues that I heard today are addressed, dealing with the lease, uh, dealing with the application fees. In today's technology, what do we need application fees for? A lot of this is just online. There's no real physical work or anything involved for them to do credit check, background cr checks and such. Uh, many of the issues that we're dealing with has to do with increase of fees also that's not acknowledged. But one of the main concerns that I have here is that these fees that we're talking about, application fees, it's not the big issue. It's really the rent itself. It's really what I heard two property owners state that they haven't had any evictions. This should be the common nature of property owners. First, working with the tenants. They, they, a lot of times they have long-term relationships. They talk to each other. They know who these people are. But then once again, they get behind a little bit in rent and they're no longer our human being. They're nothing but a target. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes. And it's two minutes, Rep. Can you submit the rest of your testimony in writing? Certainly would appreciate yes, that. Thank you. thank you. I don't see anyone else coming to the table in Las Vegas and no one here. Uh, Senator Danyate, you have closing remarks. Um, and uh, I want to leave room to if any of the uh, committee members have a question. Members have questions? Okay. Senator Stone, you had a third question? Uh, in deference to your request, I will uh, speak with Senator Dignati about a plethora of issues that, uh, I, I mean, there's some very good points to this legislation that I strongly support. There are some areas that uh, I would, I'd love to have the opportunity to chat with you about. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just by way of commentary, and I know that there are a lot of um, good, honest, and deserving people who are landlords. Um, the unfortunate thing is that the few uh, really taint the many. And um, I've had conversations with the Apartment uh, Association and just suggested whatever you all can do to clean that up, uh, you know, and make sure the folks that are 
um, representing you, that are landlords that are representing you and that are doing these sorts of things, they need to stop it. They need to quit. Um, I had an um, I had someone to call me uh, in 20, 21, 21, uh, and their uncle um, is a disabled veteran, 72, and the landlord was going to evict them and only gave them two weeks' notice and uh, held on to the deposit, and the family basically took up an offering uh, to try to make sure that they could get into another place. Um, I don't understand how anyone could do that to someone who's disabled. I don't understand how someone could do something like that to a veteran, um, especially. Uh, but it did happen, and as I said before, there are many good uh, and honest landlords, but there are a few that are just making it a horrible impression for the many. So, Den Senator Donate. I'm sorry, we didn't go to neutral on the phone. Thank you. Neutral on the phone. You can say there. I don't, I don't know if we have too many. Neutral on the phone. Thank you, Chair. If you'd like to testify neutral on SB 78, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Again, if you'd like to testify neutral on SB 78, please press star 9 now. Chair, you have no one that is neutral at this time. Thank you. Senator Donate. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Speaker. Uh, to reel this back in as to part of the theme that we were discussing today, you know, we mentioned good landlords. My parents are landlords. And for them, purchasing a second home was an achievement that had not prior, happened prior to them. And for us, it meant a moment of reaching part of the American dream where now we can reflect back and look at the wealth that we have built together. And today's bill, you know, we have the opportunity to level the playing field and better enhance the tenant-landlord relationship. And like many of those who are testifying, I too hope that one day I could purchase a home of, of my own. And in general, what we have done through this bill is that we believe that Nevadans have been hurting and they deserve safe and attainable housing for all, and we can do better. So thank you so much for having us here today. Thank you. And with that, we will close the hearing on Senate Bill 78. Let me take a couple of minutes for those who uh, are leaving to do so, and then we will hear Senate Bill 95. Um, just let me know, do we need to break for lunch or? <laughs> okay. Okay, Senator Moran. I will just uh, encourage everyone to say ditto. <laughs> Um, good morning, Chair Spearman, Vice Chair Lang, and members of the Senate Commerce and Labor Committee. For the record, I'm Rochelle Wynn, representing Senate District 3. It's my honor to be here to present Senate Bill 195, and I'm joined today by Lake Martin, who is the Executive Director of the Can Nevada Cannabis Association and a Professor of Cannabis Policy at UNLV, as well as Chelsea Capurro, a partner at the Griffin Company. And this is Ms. Martin's very first time presenting a bill, so she's very excited, so um, be gentle with her or haze her, either way. Um, in, in 2019, the legislature created a Cannabis Compliance Board with the passage of Assembly Bill 533. The Cannabis Compliance Board, which is also called the CCB, began regulating the cannabis industry on July 1, 2020. In that time since the Cannabis Compliance Board was created, there have been many successes and there have been many growing pains. And I expect that we will probably be back here year after year, session after session, trying to clean up what is a baby board or a baby commission. Earlier this year, the Cannabis Business and the Nevada Cannabis Association reached out to me seeking to address some of those growing pains, and that is how Senate Bill 195 came to be. It was actually even more personal than that. I think I talked about the craft brewers in our previous bill presentation um, coming to me um, 
um, from my own neighborhood and my own constituency base. And this happened on the same road that I live in. I was talking to someone within the cannabis industry that lives on the same road as me and was telling me some of the struggles that they were dealing with um, in trying to um, not only um, survive within the cannabis industry, but also try to survive. So the shout out goes to Bonnie Chu in my neighborhood. So um, the goal of Senate Bill 195 is to support the growth and stability of this new industry while ensuring um, public safety. The cannabis industry employs about 18,000 Nevadans and last year sent um, $147 million to the State Education Fund. We submitted a report as a part of an exhibit that estimates that the licensed cannabis industry has an economic impact in the state of Nevada of about $2 billion annually. And while the industry has grown steadily since 2017, Nevada is now seeing a decline in sales. If you look at, for example, fiscal year 2022 was actually down 4% from 2021. And this year, licensed cannabis sales are down by as much as 20% month over month by, as, by comparison from even last year. Um, this bill encourages cooperation between regulators and the industry just like we see in gaming. And I know that when we created in 2019, some of the intent behind creating the Cannabis Compliance Board was to emulate that relationship, emulate that board and that regulatory board of the Gaming Commission. And um, we're just not seeing that. And I think that has nothing to do with the people that are a part of the board. It has nothing to do with that. I think we just have a responsibility as legislators to keep coming back and reviewing what is working and what is not working. This bill does encourage that cooperation between regulators and the industry. Um, it does that by incentivizing and rewarding compliance by adding transparency and consistency to the disciplinary process for licensees and reducing excessive fees that are threatening the sustainability of licensed cannabis build businesses. Not only are these fines and fees a threat to the existing industry, but they will create significant challenges for any new entrepreneurs trying to open up a licensed cannabis business in Nevada. Um, I, it, this is a unique industry in the fact that they are not just competing within the regulated market. Um, I've heard estimates of upwards of 50 to 60 percent of their competition comes from the black and gray markets. And so those people are obviously not paying taxes. Those people are not regulating um, and testing the products that are going out. Um, they are not subject to audits and fines and fees and taxes and all those things, but they are being forced to compete with that market. And so when we have an overregulated industry that doesn't allow people to efficiently and effectively and safely like um, grow, I think you will see a even bigger growing market of black market and gray market sales. So with that, Chair Spearman, with your permission, I'd like to hand this over to Executive Director of Cannabis, Lake Martin, to walk through the various sections of the bill. Yes, ma'am. Please begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Spearman, Vice Chair Lang, and members of the Senate Commerce and Labor Committee. For the record, I'm Lake Martin, Executive Director of the Nevada Cannabis Association. The NCA is the Trade Association for Licensed Cannabis Businesses in Nevada. We have several members here today in support of this bill, and we want to extend our appreciation to Senator Wynn and the sponsors and co-sponsors of this bill who have been so receptive to the business owners who reached out asking for help. This bill has broad support from the industry and is directly targeted to addressing some of the challenges licensed cannabis businesses are facing. I'll now walk through the sections of the bill. Section two authorizes the CCB to resolve disciplinary complaints through a settlement agreement which codifies existing practice. Subsection two states that in reviewing settlements, the board shall consider certain mitigating factors. Section three spells out those mitigating factors and requires the board to state on the record which mitigating factors are present and what weight the board will give those factors. One of the policy goals of this bill is to encourage self-reporting. Self-reporting is where a licensee discovers a violation and reports it directly to the CCB. And encouraging self-reporting is a key part of oversight of other regulated industries. It increases public safety, conserves state resources, and incentivizes compliance. 
Section 3 also establishes other mitigating factors, such as where the licensee has submitted a plan of correction and taken action to correct the violation, where the licensee has made a good faith effort to prevent violations from occurring, where the licensee cooperates in the investigation, that applies to agent card holders as well, and any other mitigating factors established by the board in regulation. Section 3 subsection 2 requires the CCB to take action to approve or reject a licensee's proposed plan of correction within 30 days or else the plan is deemed approved. Plans of corrections are existing tools that are used for compliance and correcting issues and this is just ensuring that the licensees receive a response to their proposed plan so they can move forward. Section 4 again authorizes the board to settle disciplinary complaints. It also requires the board to consider mitigating factors when making a determination of a civil penalty outside of a settlement agreement. So in other words, if the complaint went to a hearing and the board or hearing officer recommended a civil penalty, then the board shall still consider mitigating factors when imposing any fine. Section 5 addresses the practice of violation stacking. Nevada Cannabis Compliance Regulation 4 sets out a system of progressive discipline. With the exception of the most serious violations involving public safety, the system is set up so that the first violation gives rise to a warning, and then if that matter hasn't been corrected or occurs again, the licensee would incur fines at increasing amounts as well as possible suspension or revocation as, you know, if, this, if the violations aren't corrected. Violation stacking is where licensees are charged violations arising from the same occurrence. For example, um, once a cannabis plant in a cultivation reaches eight inches tall, it must be tagged with a metric label for seed to sale tracking. If a CCB inspector an enters the building and finds 100 plants that are nine inches tall and aren't properly tagged, then the licensee is often charged with 100 violations. This Current practice is contrary to the intent of the progressive discipline system, which is designed to give a warning or smaller fine and educate the licensee that the practice is non-compliant and give them the opportunity to correct. The stacking of violations also increases the amount of fines that, and could lead to suspension or revocation. The goal of this section is to get to a place where we're utilizing the progressive discipline system that we have in place as it was intended and designed to educate, correct behavior, and incentivize future compliance. Section 6 reiterates the language of Section 4 that the board must consider mitigating factors as part of determining civil penalties. Section 7 would define the maximum civil penalty for a single violation as $20,000. Nevada currently has one of the highest maximum penalties per violation in the country. Most states have a cap at $50,000 or below per violation. Section 7 also clarifies existing language regarding what the CCB can do in response to a violation, including issuing a penalty, suspension or revocation, or issuing a warning if no penalty is warranted under the circumstances. Sections 8 and 9 incorporate sections 2 and 3 regarding consideration of mitigating circumstances into the statutory provisions for allowing judicial review of a final order of the board. Section 10 describes the current practice of transferring ownership interests and allows the board to adopt re regulations regarding the transfer of ownership interests. Section 11 allows the board to collect from licensees the actual costs paid to third parties for any background checks performed in connection with initial applications or transfers of ownership. Actual costs had not been previously defined in statute and that term was interpreted broadly to encompass all staff time for background investigations. Section 11, subsection 6, would prohibit the current practice of time and effort billing. Time and effort billing is the CCB's practice of charging licensees at an hourly rate for CCB staff time. It is not currently authorized by statute. It is essentially double billing licensees for CCB's overhead costs. The double billing occurs because the agency is already fully funded by the wholesale excise tax. The CCB bills licensees for inspections, audits, travel time, reviewing security footage, even communicating with licensees to resolve a compliance issue. If you're a licensee and you have a meeting with the CCB about an issue, you will get a bill from the CCB for their staff's time at the hourly rate of $111 per hour. It doesn't matter if the staff person is brand new. They are still billed at the rate of $111 per hour. If there are three CCB staff at the meeting, you'll get a bill for $333, the hourly rate for all three people. It's impossible for licensees to budget for these expenses, and it's challenging for them to control costs. There's no caps on these bills. There's no fee schedule or appeal process. You have to pay or your license won't be renewed. There's at least one licensee on a payment plan because they can't keep up with these bills for, that they're receiving from the CCB. What's unique about the CCB is that unlike other regulatory agencies, the CCB's entire operating budget is covered by the wholesale excise tax. 
The CCB does not get its funding from the general fund. It's fully funded by that 15% wholesale excise tax on cannabis products. And the $63 million that's brought in annually from that tax is more than six times the CCB's operating budget. The CCB doesn't need to generate revenue through additional fees, nor does the statute direct it to. This practice has a direct negative impact on every current and future licensed cannabis businesses' ability to succeed. Licensees are sending tens of thousands of dollars to the CCB every month instead of putting those funds toward growing their businesses and hiring employees. This bill would put an end to that practice. Section 12 makes renumbering changes, and that concludes the walkthrough of the bill. Thank you. Um, questions? Committee members? Senator Stone? Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for the presentation and, uh, and meeting with me in my office. And, uh, and, and I re really want to applaud the author for, for bringing this forward. And uh, a, a big concern of mine has been this uh, time and effort of billing. Uh, I have an example here of a bill that a, uh, a vendor got that was uh, thousands and thousands of dollars above and beyond their license fees. Um, can you talk about how uh, this originated and are these fees that are presently collected, which we, I think, agree are not appropriate, are they going into the CCB funds or are they going into the general fund at this time? Thank you, Lake Martin, for the record. So these fees have an interesting history. Uh, oversight billing of medical marijuana establishments was added to the administrative code back when the Department of Public and Behavioral Health oversaw the medical industry. At that time, there wasn't a dedicated funding source for the DPPH to oversee medical marijuana. <clears throat> so DPPH is authorized by statute to bill for inspections. So that's what they did. They would bill medical licensees for inspection. However, in 2017, the oversight of the cannabis industry was transferred over to Department of Tax, which doesn't have a statutory right to bill for inspections. However, the practice continued. Because it was minimal and licensees really were just receiving hourly bills for inspections, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't much pushback at that time. And the code carried over as well. Then when it transferred over to um, the Cannabis Compliance Board, they also didn't have clear statutory authority to bill for inspections or any other oversight. Additionally, they don't have general authority to um, collect fees for the administration of Title 56. They have very specific fees that are enumerated in the statute, and the statute clearly says that they're limited to those fees. So this was like an administrative code holdover that wasn't corrected. And then the issue in 2017 when REC came online, the funding mechanism was changed because the regulators previously hadn't been fully funded. In 2017, the legislature decided we needed to fully fund the regulator and created the statutory mechanism of the wholesale excise tax to do so. Mm -hmm. And so under uh, NRS 372A290, the operations of the regulator are funded fully first and then $5 million is sent to local enforcement, and then the remainder goes to the State Education Fund. There's still a dedicated stream to the State Education Fund through the retail excise tax. So last year we sent $87 million directly to education. This is just anything over goes to the State Education Fund. Thank you, Thank you for clarifying that, and, and I also appreciate the provision in the, uh, the bill as far as stacking. Uh, that's, uh, that's, an, that's an abuse of, of uh, sec, uh, putting fees on, on these growers and retailers. And lastly, I'll just say, Madam Chair, that uh, you know our regulatory boards, um, I believe that they should be existing to help people comply with the complexities of the law and, and, and make recommendations how to better comply with the law. I like the fact that you give a warning, hey, listen, uh, we found 100 plants that are you know eight inches, 8.2 inches tall. You need to get those tagged. Otherwise, next time we come in here, we're going to unfortunately have to give you a fine. So, in the spirit of being more business friendly, this, this is the attitude I think our commissions need to have. And, uh, and again, I want to thank you for bringing this bill forward. Thank you. Additional questions, Senator Buck. Thank you, Chair Spearman. Uh, you had mentioned $145 million that goes into the education fund. Was that just taxes, or was that also uh, the fees and billable hours? 
Thank you, Lake Martin, for the record. It's a combination of everything. So it is both the wholesale excise tax, the retail excise tax, and then any licensing fees, any fines, um, and any time and effort billing. So I can assume that that would go down then um, if this bill passes. Um, like my colleague um, over here, uh, I do agree that how do you run a business when you don't know, you don't want them to come through the door <laughs> because they'll um, bill you for all these billable hours. So um, I'm in full support of this bill. Thank you. Chair, if I just can comment, Rochelle Wynn for the record. Um, you know, some of the, the, the suggestions and the reason that came to me is they seemed like common sense. Um, I've learned enough with working with the Fines and Fees Justice Center on um, criminal traffic tickets and looking at we shouldn't be funding agencies based on fines and fees. I think it's a terrible policy that encourages um, people not to work within the industry to promote business friendly pol policies but to do this and in this case we're in a unique situation where we do fully fund this agency and they can work to gather with the industry um, to make it efficient make it safe and make it um, you know able to grow within this industry so that was part of the reason that I did that and coming from a law background self-reporting is seen not only in the legal industry but in almost every other industry, um, if you didn't have self-reporting and there wasn't a distinction between getting caught doing the wrong thing and self-reporting, like let's say you were an industry like under the current model, if you had those plants that grew up like, you know, an inch higher than they were supposed to, um, you know, and you had a hundred of them, instead of having a hundred thousand dollars in fines, if you got caught during an audit, if you contacted and said, hey, look, we messed up, we have a hundred plans, they're all like an inch higher than they're supposed to be, um, and you self-reported, you would have that same penalty under our current model than you would if you got caught like, you know, um, being in violation. So that, that was one of the personal reasons that this makes sense to me and why I think um, this committee and this uh, legislative body should support Senate Bill 195. Senator Scheibel. Thank you. And I just wanted to clarify for the record kind of the scope of the CCB's um, authority because it's my understanding, like we've been talking about, that it, the CCB is the regulatory body that covers all cannabis um, uh, in the whole, the whole industry, both from the production to the processing to the transport to a dispensary to how it's sold in a dispensary. Um, that that whole chain is all covered by the CCB. We're not talking about like just dispensaries or just growers. We're talking about the entire chain, right? Yes, Lake Martin for the record. Yes, that's correct. The CCB oversees the entire supply chain and all licensees. Thank you. Additional questions? Um, Ms. Martin, I think you mentioned something about, or was it you, Senator, budget um, the fines and fees go way above the budget. What's the budget for CCB? Do you know? And and what happens to that overage? Yes, okay. thank you, Lake Martin, for the record. So the operational budget, the operating budget of the CCB to pay for staff, et cetera, is about ten million. Um, and then they, for instance, last year, last fiscal year, generated another eight million in fines and fees. And where does that go? Yeah. So that uh, anything that they collect. Um, along with the wholesale excise tax, it funds the CCB first, then $5 million to local enforcement, to counties for local enforcement, and the rest goes to the state education fund. So if it's $18 million, the $10 million is the budget, $5 million goes to local, and then $3 million goes to education. In addition to the $63 million that comes in directly through the wholesale excise tax. Okay. Uh, Senator Nguyen, do you have anyone else who's going to present? Okay. So then we will move to uh, testimony in support of Senate Bill 195. Um, and let's just take two minutes each. And if someone has uh, said what you want to say, ditto is an appropriate response. 
uh, particularly given the fact that we are now beyond 11 o'clock. Good morning, Chairwoman Spearman and committee members. My name is Quanin Villa, and I'm an owner of Green Life Productions, a small family-owned cannabis farm located in Pahrump, Nevada. I am here to testify in support of SB 195. Green Life Productions is one of the very first legal cannabis farms to open in Nevada and we grow sustainable, high-quality cannabis for over eight years using a no-to-living soil process that reduces waste, conserves water, and eliminates the need for pesticides and fertilizers. I am proud to share that we are currently on our 32nd cycle using the same soil with an almost perfect pass rate without using a third-party licensed testing lab. We are part of our process, our commitment to sustainability and waste, and waste reduction, and ultimately our safe, high-quality medical-grade cannabis flower. We have followed the FDA and USDA-supported growing methodology from the beginning and have been regulated by three different state agencies. During a routine inspection of our facility, new CCB agents unfamiliar with our small family farms growing methodology began making claims about our process that were like nothing we have heard before. False claims about the safety of our process have been the hardest to reconcile. We have been forced to defend eight years of methodology, leading to months and months of consultations, meetings, and the updating of our standard operating procedures. In addition to the meetings and consultations required to defend our growing process, the CCB was been, has been researching the cultivation method, science, federal, agricultural, and safety standards that already support our growing process, and billing us for, and billing us, billing, <laughs> billing us for all of it. These bills, and I have copies I can share, will often be large blocks of time with vague entries. One included a 75-hour entry for work ongoing. That time alone cost us $8,325. In total, we have paid the CCB approximately $47,000 in time and effort fees since 2021 inspection. And what have all these time and effort bills from the CCB accomplished? We have arrived right back to where we started, which is the approved continuation of our family farm methodology that we have used for eight years. I also want to share that our family owns an organic farm in Pahrump, Green Life Produce, and that our relationship with other state agencies like the Department of Agriculture, the HHS, and the, and the Division of Water Resources have been far more supportive. Excuse we me, we have two minutes. Okay, <laughs> thank um, you. Yeah, and can you just submit the rest of it? You got it. Okay. Thank um, you. And I understand they're, they're probably auditioning for the guy on TV says, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Spearman and members of the Senate Commerce and Labor Committee. My name is Brandon Weigand, spelled W-I-E-G-A-N-D. I'm the president of the Nevada Cannabis Association and chief operating officer of Thrive Cannabis Marketplace. I've been a part of the cannabis industry since 2015. In that time, we've had three different regulators, each with their own practices and culture. Our sincere hope as an industry is that the passage of AB 533 and the creation of the Cannabis Compliance Board would bring stability and growth. The reality, however, is that we've gotten off to a rocky start. The CCB has taken a hostile stance and aggressive approach to enforcement of cannabis licensees while simultaneously billing those licensees millions of dollars a year in fees for its own staff's time, time which is already funded by the wholesale marijuana tax levied against those same licensees. For cannabis businesses in Nevada, there is zero margin for error. Imagine you're the manager of a dispensary who discovers non-compliant behavior by an employee, behavior that violates the training you've administered and the SOPs your company has developed. You'd think that catching, correcting, and self-reporting an employee's rogue actions would be commended. That is not how the CCB has handled these incidents. Instead, licensees are asking themselves whether or not to risk self-reporting an incident, knowing they'll face tens of thousands of dollars in fines, that reporting that could trigger an inspection that would result in additional citations for unrelated de minimis violations, and that the CCB will st and then stack those incidents into six-figure fines and threaten suspension or revocation of your license. You also get a bill for all the CCB staff time investigating the incident. The CB, CCB is not required to consider mitigating factors like self-reporting when considering punishment. So even though incidents should be self-reported and a safe and well-run industry depends on self-reporting, the behavior of the CCB has created a culture of fear that permeates the industry, impacting licensees and their employees. In every state but Nevada, the highest civil penalties are reserved for cannabis businesses operating without a license. Here, the exact opposite is true. The only operators paying six-figure fines are legal cannabis licensees. When it comes to enforcing unlicensed cannabis businesses, the CCB has completely ignored the flourishing unlicensed market, focusing enforcement exclusively against legally operating licensees. On behalf of the NCA and Thrive, we support SB 195 and believe that these reforms will put the CCB in the industry on a path of cooperation where education and communication, rather than fines and fees, Thank become you. the key tools used to ensure compliance and public safety. Thank, Thank you. you. If you can uh, submit the rest of that. And, um, you know, um, I'm sorry, the first young lady who spoke, you said you've got examples. Uh, can you 
uh, make sure that uh, the secretary gets copies of those so that uh, members of the committee can see that as well. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, if we have anyone down south who is in support of Senate Bill 195, uh, please come to the table and broadcast. Uh, get ready to queue up anyone who's on the phone in support. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Daniel Stewart with Brownstein Hyatt, uh, Farber & Shrek. We represent licensed cannabis operator PSOS. Uh, I'm here to testify in support, um, echo much of what has been said, but I do want to offer just two, uh, two additional points uh, building on uh, some of the things the sponsor said. Um, I, uh, I've been involved in the, the legal cannabis industry since 2013 with uh, zero expectation or really understanding how that happened uh, until 2013 uh, in my sterile and um, uh, it seems to be incredibly sheltered life. I'd never even seen uh, cannabis, much less uh, used it. Uh, but I've been in, both in the private uh, sector and in the government service. I've been involved heavily in the policies over this last decade. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the listed market and, and why that's such an issue. Um, we have an emerging uh, legal cannabis industry, but the cannabis industry itself has been around forever, uh, and it's going to keep going around. Um, the, when we move from licensed to unlicensed, that often becomes a job of law enforcement, and um, rightfully so, uh, they're not involved much in cannabis prosecution. So you end up with this area where it's, in, it's easy to be uh, uh, operating in an unlicensed market. Uh, illicit market, and that, that's uh, incredibly difficult for both the current licensees and for this industry as a whole. Uh, lastly, I just want to say this is the right place to have this policy. I've, I've worked closely with the CCB in a lot of different capacities, and I know they're under tremendous pressure to often develop policy on an ad hoc basis, on a case-by-case -case basis based upon uh, what comes up, um, and I believe that the best way to do that is here at the legislature. So uh, I'm grateful for this bill. I'm grateful for the chance to support it and the sponsor, and I uh, urge support for it. Thanks. Good morning, Chair Spearman and members of the committee. Ashley Cruz with Career Nevada for the record here on behalf of the Chamber of Cannabis in support of SB 195. The Chamber of Cannabis is Nevada's largest and most diverse 501c6 business trade organization comprised of 62 businesses and 400 industry professionals. The Chamber creates a more conscientious, inclusive, and thriving industry by moving commerce forward, restoring justice, and positively impacting our community. The Chamber of Cannabis supports SB 195 and thanks the sponsor for bringing this bill forward. Hello, Will Adler, uh, for the record, uh, with Silver State Government Relations, representing uh, the Sierra Cannabis Coalition. Uh, I would first like to thank the Senator Wynn uh, for coming forward and bringing this bill uh, you know, to you all, because uh, the cannabis industry in Nevada is a legal business, and we would like to be treated like legal businesses in the state and not, you know, uh, over overruled by the CCB in all ways. But uh, the, the real focus of this is sort of restructuring how we're treated as an industry. And a, a couple examples are the time and effort bills. Uh, and, and to cover that in, in depth, we are already directed that the license fees we pay will cover the entire cost of future license transfers, the operations with the CCB operates to do background checks and every other such thing. Yet my client got two licenses together. Uh, their time and effort bills were $67,000 last year. And they also paid a license fees about $280,000 last year together. Together, that's about $300,000 in fees from one group going to the state of Nevada from things that really should have been covered by the $28,000 with the licensing fees that we already pay. In uh, addition to that, Time and effort bills you might hear are nothing new in the state of Nevada. CCB might even represent that they've been doing time and effort in the past. This is true, but this was done under the Department of Taxation where we were billed for physical time. The auditors and people were in our building. We could actually count the people in the building, count up the hours they spent in our, our building, and we would get a bill that was similar to that under taxation. Today, the CCB has changed that through digital audits and other mechanisms where we just seeing a single bill for a single month with several thousand dollars worth of time and effort bills sent to us and we are due to pay that or we don't get our license renewed by, by the end of the year. Uh, additionally to that, I would just like to say that, you know, the stacking of charges is one that is, is severely underrated in, in, in how harmful it is to the cannabis industry. Yes, you're, you're operating as best you can. Yes, you're doing things, and there are some errors in a facility. Well, they won't just stack one charge of one type with, you know, a number of plants that have 
number of uh, you know untagged plants. They'll take the multitude of things they find in a facility, the number of plants, the unwashed sink, the, the lack of a mop bucket, right? No paper towels. All those add together into a single charge for a single inspection that will end up being, in a lot of cases, over $500,000 in charges that go directly to one license holder for one inspection. Mr. Adler? Yes. Thank you so much. I will wrap up with this one sentence. <laughs> I would say this, though, that, that the, the one thing with the stacking charges, the CCB also levies a revocation of license against the license holder. In the state of Nevada, if you lose one license, you can no longer operate any of your licenses in the state. So if you say, hey, I have a $500,000 charge, I'll give up that one license, you cannot. You will no longer be able to operate any of your licenses no. in the cannabis space. You, thank you, you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, I think I'm losing control here. <laughs> Uh, between between a beer and a weed, my goodness. Okay, anyway. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair and Committee, and thank you for seeing me again. I'm Aisha Goins, for the record, A-E-S-H-A-G-O-I-N-S, -S, and I am here on behalf of myself and the organization that I founded, CEIC. My organization has been around for five years. We are focused on disenfranchised people, those persons most impacted by the war on drugs. And this bill specifically will help assist those new social equity licenses. I am extremely concerned about how these fees show up, how they are uh, allocated, and I don't know if these new licensees will have the funding necessary to sustain their business models. And so that's a real large concern for me. The number two reason why I'm here and I am in support of this bill is because currently the Cannabis Compliance Board can find employees along with the business owners when they are out of compliance. And what has been happening traditionally is the licensees will fire that employee and then find that employee and then hold their agent card and their ability to work for a period of time. My concern around that is these people have risked a whole lot to want to be in this industry and then also they're being fined for compliance and these fines, my organization have reached out to a few of the young people that have been fined and I don't understand how the fines work. However, what I will say is I think $2,500 is expensive $3,000 is expensive, and then not to be able to go back into the industry, how are they going to pay those fines? So those are the reasons, those are specific reasons why I am for this bill, and I urge your support. Thank you very much. Ms. Goins, can you uh, tell us what the alphabets mean? Cannabis yeah. Equity and Inclusion Community. Thank you. Anyone else is down south? I don't see anyone at the table. Anyone here? Yes, ma'am, please. Thank you, Chair Spearman and the committee. Um, thank you for this opportunity to express our support for Senate Bill 195. As for the record, Esther Badiata, B-A-D-I-A-T-A -A -A, with Solid Consulting, on behalf of um, Planet 13 Holdings, RMBW, and Harding Premium Cannabis Dispensary. We're proud to support SB 195. This bill will make critical reforms to the regulation of cannabis licensees that, which, that will help stabilize the legal industry and promote its continued growth. I have no doubt that these key changes will have a constructive effect, enabling licensees to continue expanding our tax base for K through 12 education and adding to the already robust development of living wages in Nevada. This legislation makes important changes to ease the unanticipated burdens experienced by these operating, those operating in the legal cannabis industry, just as the industry has faced crippling decline in sales over this past year. We believe these enhancements will facilitate greater compliance as well as foster new investment in the state by refining statutes in pursuit of a more equitable, equitable um, regulatory structure. We look forward to helping pass this bill and we urge the committee to join us in its support. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. My name is Amanda Connor, C-O-N-N-O-R. I am a partner with the law firm of Connor & Connor, and I am a cannabis attorney that has been representing clients for licensing and regulatory compliance related to Nevada cannabis licenses since 2013. Currently, my firm represents over 200 Nevada cannabis licenses, or approximately one-third of Nevada's cannabis industry. I am here to testify in support of Senate Bill 195. 
As a cannabis attorney, I strongly encourage consideration and adoption of the mitigation factors for discipline, including self-reporting, to foster a collaborative culture that places an importance on compliance without fear-mongering. The importance of self-reporting or having the ability to reach out to the regulator to ask questions cannot be understated. When the industry feels comfortable to seek guidance from the regulator and or to self-report without fear of retribution or excessive discipline, everyone benefits. In contrast, as has been the current status operandi, when the regulator fines companies thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars for asking compliance questions or for self-reporting violations while identifying corrective actions, an aura of fear surrounds the industry and a culture of silence and suppression has been created. The consumer and the state is best served when there is an emphasis on involving systems and processes through constructive oversight. In conclusion, I would like to suggest that the goal should be to foster a culture of public safety while allowing the industry to flourish. Thank you. Good morning, Brett Scolari, S-C-O-L-A-R-I, with Strategies 360 on behalf of uh, numerous cannabis clients, big, small, uh, multi-state, public, private, um, here in support of SB 195. And just would like to echo all the comments that have been made and, and really um, thank Senator Wynn and the Nevada Cannabis Association for bringing this forward. I think it's a very good start um, to foster some discussions that I hope this body also um, takes up in this session um, to foster those discussions, look at what's worked, look at what hasn't worked, um, spur the um, Cannabis Compliance Board to have um, real policy discussions on issues that come up and discipline and otherwise, and uh, we really would support this and other measures to help foster that relationship that can be constructive and based upon re mutual respect and not fear. So I thank you and urge your support. Thank you. Um, broadcast, let's go to the phones. We're in testimony you, for Chair. support. If you would like to support SB 195, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Wiz Rizard with Americans for Prosperity, last name spelled R-O-U-Z-A-R-D. I will first take the time to say thank you, Chairwoman Spearman, and all the committee members. You all have been phenomenal all day, and I appreciate you really driving these bills to be heard. Thank you to the sponsor, Sen Senator Wynn, for bringing this bill forward. Uh, we look to make Nevada a model state for economic opportunity. With emerging markets like this, when we talk about licensing reform, this is a prime example why. Free markets always reign, and we never want to put people in a position to where other market forces are uh, winning. In other words, we don't also want to create pervasive incentives. When we saw that agencies, as Senator Stone shared, uh, we shouldn't be incentivizing these type of practices. So we do urge our support. I won't be long because I know it's probably lunchtime for everyone, but we do appreciate uh, Senator Wynn bringing this bill forward, and it's a support. Thank you. Broadcast, anyone else on? Yep. Okay. May I speak? Yes, Hello, you may. My name Please is continue. John. Yep. My name is John Akel, A C K E L L, and I'm the general manager of Zenway Corp. Zenway Corp is a Nevada State licensed indoor cannabis cultivation located in North Las Vegas. We are an independent company, not affiliated with any other entity and employ approximately 22 full-time employees. For the points raised today, Zenway Corp supports SB 195 and would welcome important and necessary changes to the laws and regulations affecting cannabis cultivation facilities. Thank you for addressing these important issues in this legislative session.
caller with the last two digits of 831. We can see you're unmuted. Please continue. Hello, thank you. My name is Salpi Boyajian, B-O-Y-A-J-I-A-N. I am the president and founder of formerly known as Flower One. We are one of the largest uh, cannabis cultivation and production facilities located here in North Las Vegas. I first want to say I thank you for hearing this bill. I am in full support, and I want to make a point that as one of the original founders, I have moved here from L.A. to Nevada because I felt like this was the state where we could make the most impact and truly be the gold standard for what we want to see, how the industry of cannabis has progressed over the last few years. And I, I'm, I would like to think that this bill is truly helping speak for us as the licensees in requesting that transparency truly be at the core of what we're looking for here. And thank you for your time. If you just joined us, we are currently in support of SB 195. To testify in support, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no more callers in support at this time. Thank you. We'll move to opposition. Opposition here in Carson City and opposition in Las Vegas. If you're in opposition, please come to the table. Don't see anyone broadcast. Do we have anyone on the phones in opposition? If you'd like to testify in opposition of SB 195, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no callers in opposition at this time. So we will move now to those neutral. Neutral here in Carson City. Anyone neutral in Las Vegas? Please begin. Thank you, Chair. Members of the committee, my name is Tyler Klimas. I'm the Executive Director of the Nevada Cannabis Compliance Board, providing testimony today neutral to SB 195, but also to add a little clarity to the record given today's presentation. In 2019, the legislature determined that it was in the best interest of the state to move away from regulating cannabis like alcohol and to model it after Nevada's gold standard gaming regulation. The legislative declaration in our enabling statute provided for the CCB to establish strict regulation of all persons, location, practices, associations, and activities related to the operation of cannabis establishment. Prior to the CCB's establishment on July 1st, 2020, the residents of the state and lawmakers had lost confidence and trust in a well-regulated cannabis industry, evidenced by massive litigation against the state, which is still ongoing, allegations ranging from favoritism to under-the-table dealings to corruption. We had FBI investigations into cannabis dealings. We had indicted foreign nationals trying to buy influence into the cannabis industry through political donations. This was three years ago. In the past three years, the CCB has fulfilled the legislators' request for a strict regulatory regime addressed in totality those concerns about impropriety and brought public confidence and trust that product is safe, that licensees are in compliance, and that individuals who would reflect poorly on our state's reputation and our communities have been prevented from accessing this industry. Along the way, this agency has also successfully addressed additional issues that have come before it, backlogs, processing times, flexibility and reaction to COVID restrictions, and a new licensing round free from litigation. If the regime feels like it's tough, it's because it is, and the legislat legislature provided such direction in our enabling legislation. Some of the provisions in this bill would change that direction. That doesn't mean that this board doesn't acknowledge market dynamics or doesn't want a successful industry. We do. There is risk in reducing flexibility for the CCB to regulate the industry at a time where we're still seeing significant issues within the cannabis industry. The industry is young. This regulatory body is still young. I'm testifying neutral because I believe there is opportunity to find common ground in these issues shared within this bill to bring clarity where it's needed. However, I would have concerns about moving too far outside of the policy or fracturing policy put in place only a few years ago at a time when the problems of the past have only just been resolved. And Chairwoman, if you will, just briefly, uh, Senator Stone, you mentioned um, uh, the plants, if they were over eight inches, you know, we would, a uh, regulator would want to tell that licensee uh, to tag them next time. We'll come back 
for some context, last year we issued 240 statement of deficiencies. It's when our audits and inspectors go out to a facility and they find a deficiency. Out of those 240 statements of deficiencies, the board authorized 23 complaints in total. So you see the education that's happening. Senator Wynn mentioned self-reporting and we must encourage that. Out of over a thousand in the last two and a half years, self-reported incidents, we get about 365 a year. We keep track of this data. 365 a year, some are big, some are small. We have had five self-reporting incidents end up in disciplinary action, five out of over a thousand. And then a correction quickly on the budget. Uh, you mentioned, or Ms. Martin mentioned a $10 million operating budget plus $8 million in generated revenue. That's incorrect. We generate $8 million in revenue, including time and effort fees. Our operating budget is $10 million, so we do not cover our operating budget. Some of the wholesale tax collection is used for that. The rest, then, is deposited to the state education fund. And then finally, for time and effort, certainly understanding the concerns out there. For context, out of the 240-plus entities in the state of Nevada, cannabis entities, they average $5,615 in time and effort fees a year. You've heard many people talk about higher bills. That's right, there are higher bills, but that's because there were significant compliance issues. On average, which means there's folks below, 71% are below $5,600 in time and effort billings a year. So with that, Chairwoman, thank you for allowing me an extra minute. Happy to answer any questions here or offline. Thank you, uh, Senator Scheibel. Thank you. Uh, I think I heard you correctly. You said there were 365 self-reported violations or issues, and five of them resulted in disciplinary action. We receive on average 365 a year. So in the two and a half years the CCB has existed, we've had roughly 1,000 if you follow that logic. In total, five in two and a half years, self-reported incidents have gone to a disciplinary complaint or had resulted in disciplinary action. And is it necessary to go to a disciplinary complaint or disciplinary action before a fee is assessed or a fine? Yes, as we sit here now, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? So my question would be, how much uh, were the fines um, or fees for the deficiencies? Uh, how much was that? And, and, and you, can give, you can give me a total, but if you can give me, um, you know, somewhere like, you know, a medium, mm -hmm. what's that? Because, because we've heard people testify that they were um, exorbitant, and uh, in true transparency, I have seen a couple of um, um, fines, shall I say, that were um, more than my house payment. Sure. Thank you, Chair. And that's, that's, that's correct. And, and, and again, I think when you think of the 23 complaints that were filed in a year, I mean, we don't have the time, I don't have the staff time, the resources, the council resources to go to a complaint for every single violation. Again, 240 statements of deficiencies, 23 complaints. So the complaints that do come out are egregious. There are multiple infractions, multiple infractions, which is why those fines fine amounts are so high. Now, to your question about the five self-reports, which I have, and, and to give a little context, um, you know, there are, are pillars of protecting a state-run marketplace. And when I say protecting, protecting from federal intervention. It's how we've set up these marketplaces. In fact, there was a memo sent out by the U.S. Department of Justice on what states should concentrate on to prevent and protect their state-based marketplace, given the federal designation of cannabis. Things like making sure you're preventing cannabis to getting into the hands of minors, making sure we're preventing ownership we don't know about because that lends itself to criminal elements and cartels in your industry. Um, and then also making sure that product that is grown in Nevada doesn't leave Nevada. It doesn't go into a state uh, that doesn't want a legal cannabis market. Those are some of the pillars. And so our five, again, five and two and a half years self-reporting violations all center around that, SANS 2, which had to do with um, selling more product than it is allowed in a single transaction or a transaction at a facility. So we had issues of minors getting access, so selling cannabis to minors. We had issues of hidden ownership during some of our transfer of interest investigations. Um, I can read to you, I no, can no, provide I just, to you whatever yeah. you would like, because all of this is public, transparent, and posted on I, the website. I, what, let me go back to my question. Yeah. How much? Sure. So um, I'll take the first one, self-reported of diversion. So diversion is taking product outside of the seed to sale tracking system. Um, that, was yeah, civil, that was a $52,000 yeah. civil penalty. We had an issue of four 
uh, uh, sales, three sales to minors. The fourth one, they caught it and they self-reported. That was a $115,000 civil penalty. Uh, we had uh, selling cannabis in excess of transaction limits. Uh, could have been $100,000 in a 50-day suspension. That was a $25,000 civil penalty with no suspension. So we do come down. We look at compliance history for that. The other two, Chairwoman, uh, another selling of cannabis in excess of transaction limits could have been $75,000 with a 30-day suspension. It ended up being settled to $45,000, no suspension and no complaint filed. And then finally, uh, an unapproved transfer of interest could have been a $25,000 or 20-day suspension. It ended up being $18,000 for an unapproved transfer, $45,000 for a false statement with no suspension and no complaint filed. So can you, you can just give it to me in writing. I just really want to know how much because we've heard from some people that, you know, some of the fines have been egregious. So if you can provide me that or the committee that, um, I'd appreciate it. Senator Scheibel. Thank you. And I just want to ask some clarifying questions sure. because I think that um, we're using some terms of art that I don't understand because I don't work in this field and I don't practice law in this area. And so I, what I think <clears throat> I'm gathering from everything that I've heard today is that um, there are, there, there's a process and there are different levels of violations and in these interactions that a cannabis business would have with the CCB. Again, we're, we're using terms of art like a violation and a complaint and a penalty. And I think that maybe I, and I hope I'm not alone in this, don't necessarily understand what those are. And to put it into context for me, and hope, I don't know if this will help other members of the committee, but you know, where I, I practice criminal law, and we also have terms of art like that, like a complaint. A complaint doesn't mean I don't like something I complain about it. That's a legal document in, in criminal law. And so when we talk about the number of cases that a particular jurisdiction sees, we can make distinctions between arrests, investigations, convictions, stays of adjudication. You know, there are all of these different ways that someone can be held accountable that don't necessarily have the same title associated with them. So what I'm asking you to walk me through is if I am a, a cannabis business, let's say I'm a, and it sounds like most of those violations that you spelled out were for dispensaries um, I, or, or retail uh, cannabis. So, so if I am a dispensary operator and there is a violation in my dispensary, what is the first step? Is the first step a notice? Is it an audit? Is it investigation? And then is there a period of time where I will be in contact with the CCB and they might be hourly billing me before a complaint is filed? And then if a complaint is filed, and if, if complaint's even the right word, um, is there a period of time where that complaint might be resolved or settled or negotiated or some other term of art before a violation is found or um, substantiated or whatever the term of art might be because I think that's what I'm missing and I think that's also why I'm getting confused by the testimony. It sounds like, um, you know, it sounds like people are living in two totally different worlds, which is obviously not true. We're all here. So I think what's happening is some people are using violation to mean one thing and others are using it to mean something broader. So if you could walk us through that, and I, I'm sorry, I know that we are running short on time, but I think this is important and I hope that my qu question is clear, what I'm asking you to spell out for us. Senator Tyler Climas, for the record, it was clear, and thank you for the opportunity to do this. So uh, I'll run you through. So we have an auditors, teams of auditors and inspectors. Um, so let's say they go, they go out to a dispensary and they identify a violation, right? And that's what I mean by a statement of deficiency or a statement of no deficiencies. So at the end of a routine audit or inspection, a facility like a dispensary will get a statement of deficiency if we have identified deficiencies or if they're out of compliance or if there's violations or a statement of no deficiencies, which is a clean audit, clean inspection. We're roughly right now at about 50%, and that's all included in the biennial, biennial report that you have. 50% of audits and inspections get no deficiencies, 50 get deficiencies. Can I 
interrupt before Absolutely. we get too much information sure. and I get lost. So with those thousand self-reports and we had five violations, is it possible that there were still statements of deficiencies between the, the report and the violation? Because this is the first time I'm learning of a Repeat statement that. of deficiency. So you said that there were a thousand self-reported, let's call them incidents. Correct. And five of them resulted in violations, but could 900 of them have also resulted in statements of deficiencies? So a self-report incident is, is not the result of a routine audit or inspection. So the deficiency letter comes after we have visited the facility on a routine audit or inspection, something we do on a continual basis. So two separate processes there. Got it. Um, so on a routine audit or inspection, so they have not called us to say we are self-reporting an incident. This is completely separate. So this is a routine auditor inspection. We go there. Let's say we issue a statement of deficiency. So we found some violations. We found some deficiencies. We found some things out of compliance. Then we will submit to them a plan of correction. Uh, the licensee at that point then is required, obviously, to address those instances uh, of out of compliance or non-compliance. And then they will send us back uh, a plan of correction. For that, we must approve that plan of correction. Now. Two things can happen then. If that violation rises to the level that a complaint should be filed, we will review that and then we will send it to the Attorney General's office. The Attorney General's office then will review that. And if they agree and they recommend that we move to a complaint, then we will ask the board to authorize us as a board to file a complaint. That then starts the disciplinary process. They usually settle, they can go into settlement, they can choose to have a hearing and dispute the facts. We have an administrative law judge on staff, that option is always open to them, they can do a hearing. Either way, they both, whether it's a settlement or a hearing, the hearing is a recommendation, the result of the hearing is a recommendation, they both come back in front of the board, the board has the final say. Um, they can reject the settlement, they can lower the settlement amount, they can agree with the ALJ's recommendations, they cannot. They can make their own recommendations. That's why we have a five-member managing board. But there is a, a middle ground here, and we've implemented that uh, uh, last year, which was a letter of concern. So let's say we have a deficiency that we've, we've noted. It's, uh, it could rise to a, to a complaint, but we look at their compliance history. This is the first time they've committed that violation. They have a good compliance history. We will issue a letter of concern. This is what we called it, and we created that process kind of to, to, to have uh, the ability to continue to educate rather than just go to complaint. That letter of concern says, hey, listen, this did rise to the level of a complaint. We looked at your history. We're going to just put this letter in your file. We're not going to file a complaint. We want you to know that it's there. We want you to keep track of it. We want you to concentrate on it, but we're going to move forward. And so that's been very helpful, I think, from our perspective for staff resources and I think the industry as well for the educational side of things. Thank you. Senator Daly, and then Senator Stone. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll be, I'll be quick and just uh, make a suggestion. I'm curious if you guys have ever thought of this. When I was listening to your process on your inspection, and then you'll have a deficiency letter, and then you go forward, and then the same procedures. It sounds exactly, in my experience, what OSHA does, right? So they go out, they find something, they'll give the contractor or whoever it is, if they're in violation, or the employer's not always a contractor. You can fix it immediately. If you go out and fix it and say, hey, uh, I replaced this cord, uh, they won't do that. If it's higher level, they'll um, then issue the complaint or a citation, and then you have the whole process to adjudicate that. OSHA also has, or maybe you guys could think about implementing whatever, and I forget the acronym or what it stands for, Madam Chair, but it's called the SCATS, I believe it is, where they can call you and say, hey, come in and, come in and inspect us. Tell us where we're deficient. You know, give us some advice on how to uh, make sure we're staying in compliance. But during that process, even if you find a violation, you tell them, hey, this is wrong. But you can't issue a complaint then and if they call you in. I don't know if you have a process like that or would like to think about it. I don't, you don't need to respond. Sure. Um, but uh, you do it, sounds just like OSHA, and they have a process that uh, people can call in and ask for help. Appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll make it quick as well. So uh, my experience in the past of seeing time and charges is if somebody has an accusation and they got an, an attorney general, deputy attorney general, that's got to invest time in, in potentially prosecuting or citing, the uh, 
beneficiary of, of those issues pays that bill. So my question is about, you know, we've seen some hor horrific fees, I mean, in, in the tens of thousands of dollars. And I'm not saying that people maybe didn't deserve some of these fractions, but how do you come up with the magnitude of the fees and your fee schedule? Is that something that the board does, number one and two? How much of your time is dedicated to overseeing licensed cannabis industries here versus unlicensed? And how many unlicensed facilities have you uh, uncovered and what kind of fees have you generated from them? Senator, thank you for the question. Tyler Klimas, uh, for the record, you asked about a fee schedule. So there's civil penalties and then there's time and effort. So for civil penalties in regulation are different categories. So we have five categories of violations. They each carry a max amount, dollar amount. And then as mentioned before in the testimony, they're progressive so they can go up from, from there. So those are listed in regulation and what kind of violation falls in those categories. On time and effort, we bill $111 an hour, which was discussed. That number has been unchanged since Health and Human Services. And just briefly, context, time and effort has been something that's been billed since the very beginning of the cannabis industry here in 2014 at $111 an hour. Right or wrong, I think that's going to be up to you to decide. It doesn't give me any more money to play around with, mm -hmm. more staff. It does help justify my staff positions when I ask because time and effort pays for a large part of new auditors and new inspectors. I think that's helpful. But again, we came in after taxation and we took over this body. There were unpaid bills out there. There was no real rhyme or reason on how we billed, who tracked billing, what they billed for. And so like we did with many things, we said, guess what? If this is the policy, if I have a line item in my budget that says revenue, time and effort assessment that's been approved biennium after biennium, we're going to do it the right way. And, you know, if to, to come in front of this board, if, if I were to have made a decision or even my board to have made a decision in the interim uh, that we're going to stop collecting time and effort fees. And so then I'd be in front of you explaining a big zero on my revenue that says time and effort assessment. And so that just wasn't an option and shouldn't have been an option. So that direction needs to come from the legislature. Sounds like we're going to have those discussions this biennium. And so that's the context on the time and effort on the fee schedule. Your question on unlicensed and licensed, the majority of our time is all on the licensed market. That's not to discount the incredible problem that we have on the unlicensed market, the illicit market, the gray market, the black market. It exists, and, and percentages were, were, were brought up around 60%, maybe, could be 80%, could be 40%. We don't even know that. Uh, the CCB has eight post-certified officers, uh, so we have a very, very, very small enforcement division. Uh, they've been doing work on Delta 8. They do work with state and local law enforcement on illicit market activities. They've participated on rural uh, illegal cultivation grows with Douglas County, or Douglas County uh, recently had one. So they do have an impact, but it's very minimal simply because of, 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 of what we've got there. I'll, I'll just conclude by saying that uh, in meeting with the industry, it's the exorbitant fees that they have to pass on to the customer that makes their product uh, less competitive with the black gray market, which is pushing that market that you don't regulate and go after. I see that as an inequity. So uh, I appreciate your comments and appreciate you being here today. Thank you. So I just got a couple of clarifying questions and I want to thank my colleague for giving me the term that I was reaching to try to grab for, artful terms. That was it. Um, you, you listed off um, a bevy of different tasks that you do and and so my question is, do you all have in the military call it SOP, Standard Operating Procedures? So anybody can go to that book, that file, that folder or whatever, and they can say, in this instance, this is what we do. In this instance, this is what the fine is. In this instance, this is the corrective action that we recommend that we help them to take. That's number one. Sure. I, I mean, I, to try to answer your question, Tyler Climbers, for the record, so maybe, as I mentioned, our category fines and what fines and what they would result in are listed in regulations. So maybe that's a, a blueprint for what violation may result in what disciplinary action. You talked about standard operating procedures. 
Um, that's what licensees use. We also review those as part of audits and inspections. We have checklists. So I guess you could consider those our SOPs, um, basically checklists that our auditors and inspectors go out to each facility and they go down a list. Those checklists come straight from our regulations. So that's what you're going to need to do as a licensee to comply with the rules and regulations of cannabis. Is that helping to answer your question? I may be missing it. Well, no, not really. So let me, let me try to make it more succinct. So you go out and you do an inspection. Um, do you have anything that you give to the licensee that says um, these are the things that we looked for and based upon statute, because the, the fines and fees aren't in statute, these are, these are, these are the tasks that we perform. And these, the, the cost for these tasks or the fine for these tasks or whatever you want to say, this is what it is. Or is it, is it just arbitrary and then the licensee has to wait to get whatever it is you all are going to send them? Is there something? And just, just give me a yes or no. Do you, ha do you have that? Do you, do you have that? Yes, the checklists are, are public. and, and The all fines and fees, that's what I'm looking for. The fines and fees are there. Obviously, it depends on the, the, the gravity of the violation and how many. I understand many. that, but, but you should, even, if it's, even if it's gradient, you should, have, you should have something in writing that says, you know, uh, for something that is, you know, um, minimal, uh, something that is egregious. And so because in talking to, to owners, what I have seen and what I have heard are that the fines and things, they don't, they don't really know how much it's going to be. And so... Um, you know, we, if you're going to issue something, then even before the issuance, then you should know. If you get a, if you run through a stop sign, you know there's there's something that says in 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 law, this is going to cost you. And so that should be in writing. I think that everyone who is in the industry needs that. And so please just tell me yes or no. We're we're into lunchtime. Yes or no? Do you have that document? If you'd like to answer, this is Deputy Director Michael Miles. Deputy Director Michael Miles, M-I-L-E-S. Absolutely. It's, it's our uh, Regulation 4. It's our five categories. It specifically lists the violation and lists the amount that you could be charged for that violation. And also, I believe in, uh, in Regulation 6 is where we specifically list what we charge time and effort for. So if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. And I'd, I'd really like to see that if you can submit that as part of your testimony. I'd like to see that. So the other thing that we talk about time and, and effort, um, the $10 million budget. Uh, when I chaired Health and Human Services, uh, they would go out and they would inspect certain places. Um, I don't remember them saying that for the inspector, this is what it will cost you or this is time and effort. So I'm just trying to figure out, is that, is that standard practice? I mean, we have a budget, and that is, you know, based upon the testimony that we receive, that is um, for the operation uh, of CCB. So if it's for the operation of CCB, my question is, where does the time and effort come in, and how many other agencies um, that are part of the executive branch, how many of those agencies charge time and effort? Thank you, Senator Chair, for the question. Tyler Climbers, for the record. So the time and effort was really modeled after the Gaming Control Board, and our agency is modeled after the Gaming Control Board. They charge, I believe, $158 an hour, for example. Now, we don't charge for exactly the same things, but they charge, if you want to be a new applicant and get a gaming license, you put up a retainer, $20,000, dollars $60,000, and then the Gaming Control Board investigates you as a potential licensee and draws from that account. Where we do routine audits and inspections and build time and effort, what gaming does is they review your compliance plan. So they wouldn't necessarily bill for routine audits and inspections, but you'd be required to submit your compliance plan, and then they would, the Gaming Control Board could bill for that. Um, I don't want to go, I don't want to be incorrect. They'd probably be the best one to answer that. But this is where that model came from. Okay. Uh, we can take some more of this offline. Um, where are we now? <laughs> neutral. Whew. Okay. Uh, neutral. Anybody else neutral? Okay. Okay, let's try to make it quick. I think we're going we're gonna to run up against some of the 1 o'clock committees. Okay, very quick. Um, good morning. Chair and members of the Senate Commerce and Labor Committee. My name is Rihanna Durrett. Um, 
I serve as a member of the Cannabis Compliance Board. I'm, not, I'm here in my personal capacity. I don't speak for the other board members. I was appointed in the role of somebody who has industry experience. I had worked for the Nevada Dispensary Association, now Cannabis, Nevada Cannabis Association for five years. I now am on the board and teach cannabis law at the law school. Um, I just give my background just to say I'm very familiar with the industry. Um, I've worked with or around them or now in observance of them or governing them on the board for the last nine years. Um, in general, I'd say working they are very reasonable. They usually are requesting things that go towards their stability and survival. Um, and, and they don't really tend to reach for the moon and say, okay, we'll, we'll settle from there. Um, I, I uh, again, just wanted to um, reintroduce myself, although I know most of you, um, just to let you know that offline I would be available for questions. As far as I know, I think I'm the only attorney in the state who's had a large role in the industry and now on the board that governs the industry, so I just want to make myself available. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the time, and we've got people on the phone, I know, but if you will submit your testimony in writing, we're going to back up against the 1 o'clock committees, and I want to be mindful of that. Uh, we still have not gone to floor. Uh, so I want to be mindful for that. Uh, Senator Nguyen, you have any closing comments? Uh, do you have any, let me restate, do you have any brief closing comments? Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Spearman and committee members, again, to be brief, but just to rebut a couple of the comments that were made during the, clo during the neutral testimony. Um, as you can see, this is a broad cross section of the industry that has gotten behind this bill, large companies, small companies, social equity licensees, licensees all across the supply chain. We're asking for help. There's a lot of work to do. Um, and we are trying to be compliant and trying to go toward a model that increases transparency, consistency, and incentivizing compliance. Um, to the comment that there are thousands of self-reports, many of those are for things like a security camera malfunctioning, which is required to be reported. We're looking for the big stuff and the policy goal and a self-report where you're making the decision like, wow, this could be a business ending move if I report this. You need them to, we need them to. We need to adopt policy that encourages them to do that and rewards compliant behavior. And there isn't a consistent policy in statute or reg related to self-reporting. So it's less about how they handle some of the cases, it's more about making sure that someone's making the right decision when they know that they have to self-report a violation. That's what we're trying to encourage. On the issue of time and effort billing, there is no statutory charge to ramp up time and effort billing on inspections, on audits, or anything like that. That is not something this legislator has, has given them the charge to do. They've increased time and effort billing by 500% in the last two years. It has gone from 300,000 to almost 2 million, and they project about 4 million over the biennium in time and effort billing. Again, these are charges that licensees can't budget for, can't predict, can't appeal. I think that's it. Did you have anything you wanted to add? You know, I'd encourage those members to go look at some of those categories. Um, we heard testimony here regarding a Category 3 stacking violation that ended up being $40,000. And those two Category 3 stacking violations were no paper towels in one of the bathrooms and a broken security camera. And that was a $40,000 violation when stacked um, within that category. So I think it is incumbent on us. I don't blame um, the Cannabis Compliance Board. I think we need to give them direction. I think that direction needs to come from uh, this legislative body, just like the creation of the um, body itself, um, you know, we gave direction. We don't always get it right, and that's why we are, it's incumbent on us to come back and say, what policy and what direction do we want to go in? And um, I would argue that the direction that we should go in is moving towards that gold standard, because in all honesty, our cannabis industry is far from the gold standard. Um, and um, with that, I encourage your support of Senate Bill 195. Thank you. And with that, we will close the hearing on Senate Bill 195 and open up uh, public comment briefly. And a reminder to those who are going to make public comment, uh, if you start going down the road to comment on any of the bills that we've heard, 78, 108, or 195, I will cut you off because that's not what public comment is. Okay, so uh, broadcast, do we have anyone on the phone for public comment? Public comment, again, has nothing to do with the bills that we've discussed today. 
If you would like to participate in public comment, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Okay, so it doesn't seem like we have anyone for public comment. I want to thank the uh, oh, members I, of the I, I have public comment. Okay, please qu hello? quickly, quickly. Can you guys hear me? Quickly. Um, yes, hello. My name is Erica Miniberry, for the record. And uh, my public comment is just that I uh, took time off of work today to be able to testify for the earlier bill and wasn't able to because of the limit in testimony, which I feel is really... Uh, undemocratic and insulting to people that take time out of their day to have their voices be heard. It is different to testify with my voice than it is to write things down. And um, I am somebody that's impacted by the housing crisis. I don't get to move on to the next line item because it is something that impacts me every day for people like myself that are working too much and are too frugal. The only uh, hope that we have to uh, get some relief with this housing crisis is that our elected representatives will listen to us, and that was completely shut down today, and it's really insulting to your constituents. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Broadcast, anyone else for public comment? Chair, you have no more callers for public comment at this time. Okay, thank the committee for um, the marathon, and we will be right back here uh, Friday uh, March the 10th, okay? We are now adjourned.